I used to work at a gas station many years ago. I was the clerk in the convenience store that we had, and it was open 24 hours. So, as you can guess, I worked overnights, and when I did, I would be all by myself. Now, the gas station was located across the street from some stores, such as Target and a few others, so the area would get a lot of traffic during the day. A highway was also nearby, and the gas station was on a corner. At night, though, all of the other businesses nearby closed by 10 or 11. Things would be very quiet until probably 6 a.m. or so. I worked almost every night for a while, and was getting used to being there overnights. It was mostly pretty quiet, and the gas station would get cars here and there, but people rarely came inside. Between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m., the average amount of people that came inside was probably about 4 or 5, so roughly 1 per hour. One night, I was working, and it was a typical quiet night. By now, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was behind the counter, and nobody else was inside. No cars were at any of the gas pumps either. At one point, I saw a car pulling in from the street. It was a white van, one of those typical creepy looking ones that was kind of old as well. It slowly drove up and parked in one of the spaces out front. I expected somebody to get out of the van and come inside, but instead, the van just sat there for a while. I didn't really have anything better to do other than to watch it, so I did. I couldn't tell who was driving, but soon I realized that they probably weren't going to come inside. After sitting there for maybe 20 minutes, the van eventually backed out. I thought it might leave, but instead it drove around to the side of the building. There was a few more parking spaces there, and it was now out of my sight. I honestly found this a little bit odd, and in the middle of the night, sort of creepy as well. I always tried my best not to let anything scare me though working overnights. After the van went to the side of the building, probably an hour or so went by. Now it was well past 3 a.m. Nobody came inside the store, and in that hour, only one car got gas. Then I noticed that somebody was walking on the sidewalk up towards the entrance. It appeared to be a man, and he had come from the side where the van had gone before. Could this be the driver? He was wearing a large black winter jacket, and the hood was up. But he was looking down, so I couldn't really see his face at all. He made it to the doors, and then walked inside. After entering, the man walked to the right and away from me at the counter. After disappearing down an aisle, I focused my attention back down to my phone. Several minutes went by. When I looked up again, I noticed that the man was just standing there, about 40 feet away from me. He was facing me and looking in my direction, with an angry look on his face. His hands were in his pockets, and I was confused as to what he was doing. After glaring at me for like 10 seconds, he didn't move or look away. I said hi to him, and asked him if I could help him with anything. He didn't answer me, and just kept standing there. Then I asked him if he was okay. The man still didn't answer me. I was really confused, and not sure what to do. After standing there for a few more seconds, the man then turned and slowly walked out. Then he walked back down the sidewalk and returned to the side of the building. Less than a minute later, I saw the white van drive away. I was really glad that he was gone. The rest of my shift was pretty quiet. Eventually, a few more people came in. I was trying to figure out what that guy was doing though for the rest of my shift. His behavior was just really strange. I worked almost every night back then. And probably three nights later, I was working and it was about 2 a.m. or so. Once more, I was by myself and there were no customers. It was very quiet. Then I saw a car pulling into the gas station and I soon realized that it was an old white van, just like the one from the other night. I remembered what had happened the other night and I just hoped that it was not the same guy. I was already feeling creeped out. The van slowly drove around the gas pumps and over to the parking spaces out front. Then it turned and started to back into one of the spaces. After it parked, the van sat there for several minutes. But all of a sudden, I heard a car door open and soon saw what appeared to be the same man walking around it. He went to the very back of the van and opened it up. A short time later, he emerged holding something that looked like a crowbar. Then he closed the back doors to his van and started slowly walking to the entrance. He was wearing the same thing as the time prior I had a bad feeling as I watched him slowly walk into the entrance doors. After getting inside, he then turned and started walking towards the back of the store. Quickly, he went out of my sight, 
and everything in the store became extremely quiet. About five minutes went by. Then, all of a sudden, I heard a crashing sound. It seemed like the man had hit something, probably with his crowbar. I heard another sound after that. It was like he was just whacking stuff. Several seconds into this, he seemed to move closer, and then I saw him appear in an aisle a ways away. I got out from behind the counter and ran out of the store. They weren't paying me enough to stay in there and deal with it. I ran all the way to my car and got inside of it. Then I called the police. I waited there with the doors locked, watching the store. I was parked behind the gas pumps, so I was a decent ways away from the store. Probably about three or four minutes after I called the police, I saw the guy leaving. He slowly walked out and went back inside of his van. Then he drove off. Less than a minute after he left, the police arrived. I told them that the man was gone, and we went inside the store to see that lots of things were off the shelves. It was all messed up from the guy whacking it with his crowbar. It was like he had gone on a rampage. We watched the whole thing unfold on surveillance tapes, and the guy was just whacking stuff. Then he calmly left. It was the craziest thing that I had ever seen. After that incident, the police investigated to try to look for the guy. They also had a police officer at the store overnights for the next week or so. The guy didn't come back, and I didn't work there for much longer either. I'm glad that I quit that job, because ever since it happened, I was really nervous working there at night. This happened back in 2003. I used to work at a Walgreens, and if anybody doesn't know, it's a popular pharmacy store chain that also sells lots of other items. The stores are not that large usually, and generally never too busy either. Most of the time, there's a pretty calm feeling inside. The store that I worked at used to be open 24 hours. I'm not sure if it still is, but I know that it was when I worked there. So usually, when I was working overnights, I would be all by myself for most of my shift. There really wasn't a need to have anybody else there, because I could handle everything and we never got that many overnight customers. I was also able to walk to and from work, which was very nice. I had an apartment that was just down the street and a couple of blocks over, so it would only take me about 10 minutes. Usually, I worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and it wasn't that late yet when I walked to work and wasn't too early when I walked back. One time when I was working an overnight shift, everything was going normal, and it was about 1 a.m., I believe. I remember that I heard the automatic doors opening and glanced over to see a woman entering the store. She appeared to be about 40, had dark brown hair, was maybe 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 3, and pretty thin. After entering, the woman looked in my direction and said hi, and I said hi back to her. She then walked down one of the aisles, and I focused my attention elsewhere. I was just standing behind the counter at the checkouts. We only had two check lanes, but most of the time only had one open. Several minutes went by, and I occasionally saw the woman, but I wasn't watching her or anything. She just seemed to be shopping normally. But at one point, I was just casually looking around, and I saw the woman standing like half behind an aisle. She was holding a small video camera, it appeared, and holding it in a way that it looked like she was filming me or taking my picture. I looked at her, wondering what was going on. It was like she was kind of trying to hide it too, because she was about halfway obscured. I found this really strange. After a couple of seconds of this, her camera went down suddenly, and she disappeared behind the aisle. I thought that it was odd, but not the biggest deal. About a minute later, the woman walked up to the left near the exits. She said goodnight to me as she walked out without even buying anything. I said goodnight to her, but was a little bit weirded out by the whole experience. But after she was gone, I quickly forgot about it. I mean, yeah, it was strange that she was filming me or whatever, but it's not the creepiest thing in the world. Hours went by, and several more customers came in. All of them were pretty normal. When 6 a.m. arrived, I was off, and another coworker was there. I left Walgreens and then headed back to my apartment by walking along the sidewalk. It was still dark out, and things were very quiet. Just the occasional car would pass me by on the road. As I was walking back though, one thing that was a little different was that I heard somebody walking a ways behind me. It was footsteps, but a good distance away. 
I was sort of curious, but didn't look back until I crossed over one block. As I did, I glanced over and the same woman was walking. I found this really strange. After I crossed the street, I crossed another, and then went along that sidewalk that would take me all the way back to my apartment. I didn't think the woman would do the same, but she did. That's when I started to get really creeped out. Her whole personality just seemed kind of mysterious, even when she had spoken to me saying hi and bye. The woman continued to walk behind me, but was a long ways back. Soon, I reached my apartment. I was really glad to see that she hadn't seemed to gain on me or anything. She was still about the same distance behind. Now, you had to use your key to enter the apartment building, and then I had a separate key for my unit. This made me feel better if I could just get inside. Who knows why this lady was following me, but I knew that she didn't live here. I entered my building and then went up to my apartment, which was on the second floor. My apartment was at the front side of the building, so I could look out onto the street where the woman had been walking. After I got inside, I went to the window and looked out. I saw the woman standing there on the sidewalk. She had her camera out again and was appearing to take a video of me at my window. This was just really strange. I ducked down to get out of her sight. Now she was just taking a video of my apartment window. What was the point of this? After several minutes, I looked again and she was gone. I went on with my normal routine after that. I would relax after work and eventually fall asleep. Obviously, my hours of being awake were very different than most people with me having to work overnight hours. So I fell asleep that day, probably at around nine o'clock in the morning or so. When I woke up, I remembered that it was almost 2 p.m. That was a little bit earlier than I usually woke up. But then, I remember hearing the sound of somebody trying to open my apartment door. I walked over to the door and then looked through the peephole. What I saw was a woman walking away. I just barely saw her, but it was the same woman from before. I was now extremely creeped out by this. After she left, I didn't know what to do. I watched her leave the building and then walk away down the sidewalk rather quickly. I really don't know how she got in. Probably snuck in as somebody else was leaving, which is very possible. I decided to call the police and tell them everything. They came out to investigate, and I gave them all the information that I could. I didn't really know what else to do. They said they would look into it, and after that, I never heard anything more. I also never saw the woman again. It still creeps me out when I think about it. Obviously, I don't work at Walgreens anymore and haven't for many years. I also don't live in that apartment or even the same city anymore. I still wonder what that woman was doing though. A few years back, I was working as an overnight security guard at a company. I don't remember exactly what company it was, but it wasn't that popular or anything. I worked at a lot of different places back then doing security. It was an easy job because I would just sit at a desk all night. Literally nothing ever happened. Most shifts, I wouldn't even talk to anyone. Sometimes one or two at most. I could just go on my phone and look around and get paid for it. But at this one particular company, it was a pretty standard office building for the most part. Now inside was a lobby and I would sit at a desk in there and had a computer with some basic information. The building was not really near anything else in particular and was slightly more secluded. The only other people there overnight was a security guard and a janitor. The other security guard would mostly just be outside and I knew both him and the janitor and didn't see them very much other than when I would arrive or leave or when the janitor cleaned the lobby. When I was working behind the desk one night, I would guess that it was around one o'clock in the morning or so. As I sat behind the counter, I occasionally would look around. My view was mainly of the front door and window next to it. Outside of that was a parking lot, which was empty. Behind the parking lot was a fence. I was just casually looking around when all of a sudden I saw this guy walk to the door. He looked right inside and faced me. It was really strange to see because nobody had ever come to the door before. But I then realized that this man who was standing at the door was smiling the creepiest smile I had ever seen. His eyes were so wide, like they were about to pop out of the sockets. It was very unsettling. He had to be joking or something. The man did not try to enter the building though. He just stood there at the door and kept staring at me. 
I wasn't sure what to do, so I waved at him. He did not wave back to me. He then moved out of sight, and I couldn't see him anymore. I was really confused by what had just happened. I had no idea where the guy had come from or what exactly he was doing. I tried to brush it off and figured the outside security guard would soon see the guy, so I called him to let him know, but he hadn't seen the guy at all. I got up and walked over to the door, but the guy was now out of sight. I went back to my desk and was there for the next 30 minutes or so. Then the guy was back. I just looked up and there he was, standing at the door and staring at me again with the same creepy smile. This time, I got up, but as soon as I stood up, he moved out of sight. I walked over to the door and opened it up. The man was now gone. He must have run off somewhere. I walked around outside until I found the other security guard. I told him about what had happened, and we talked for a while. Neither of us knew where the guy had gone. We looked all around the property after that, but he must have left. Then I went back inside. The property was large enough that he could have easily evaded us. And don't ask me why, but there were hardly any security cameras outside. There were a bunch inside, but only like two outside that didn't even cover that much space. For the rest of the night, I didn't see him. In fact, I never saw him again. I still wonder who he was and what he was doing. I used to work in a small convenience store in the city. It wasn't quite downtown, but was pretty close. There would be lots of people walking down the sidewalk during the day. And at night, there would still be a decent amount of people out, especially after the bars closed nearby. So our store was open 24 hours. It was pretty small, but loaded with all kinds of snacks and drinks and things like that. There were probably five aisles, and then I would be behind the counter at the far end of the store near the doors. I worked at the shop for several months and usually worked overnights. Sometimes it would be pretty busy and other times it would be really quiet. You never really knew and it depended on a lot of things, but between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. they were generally the quietest. So sometime I was working and I was by myself on a typical night. It was a little bit after 3 a.m. and the store was empty. Occasionally, I would look out the window to the street, and it seemed dead quiet. I was just sitting there behind the counter, going on my phone, and pretty soon, I heard the door open and saw a woman walking in. She entered the store and walked down one of the first aisles. Several minutes went by, and she seemed to just be shopping around like normal. Eventually, when she came up to the counter, she put several items down. When I was starting to scan them, she told me that she only had $3 and asked me if I could give her a deal. I don't remember exactly what she was buying, but I remember that it added up to like $15 total. I told her that I couldn't do that. Obviously, she would have to put some things back. I said she would only be able to get things that added up to $3. It seemed like common math to me. The woman got angry, though, and said that she wasn't going to pay for anything. I told her to leave then, and she stormed out of the store in anger. Every now and then, customers would be rude or try to get free stuff. I mean, being in a city in the middle of the night, all kinds of people would come in. I was somewhat used to less than ideal customers and thought that I knew how to deal with them. Probably 20 or 30 minutes went by. No more customers came in during that time. Then the door opened and I saw the woman come back, but behind her was a man. This guy was like six foot five, had long stringy hair and a goatee. I'm assuming he was the woman's husband or boyfriend. He walked right up to me looking all angry and then accused me of being rude to the woman. I don't remember what her name was, but the guy started cursing me out and didn't really give me any chance to talk. I could smell the alcohol in his breath as he verbally ripped into me. The woman was just standing back a few feet and adding in a few words of insults here and there to me. I remember that after them yelling at me for like a minute straight, the man wanted to, quote, take it outside with me. I told them both to get out of my store before I called the cops. That's when the guy suddenly shoved me backwards from over the counter. I wasn't ready for it, and to be honest, he was a strong dude. I fell back and it knocked me over. When I got up, I saw the man was right up at the counter wanting to fight me. I moved over to the right, and we had an alarm back there, which I pulled. It was a very loud alarm, and the sound filled the entire store. 
It was also super annoying, and the guy then backed away from the counter and grabbed some random things off the shelf and threw them. He then knocked over a stand of drinks and went into an aisle and grabbed some more things off the shelves. He stuffed them in his pockets, and the woman at the same time grabbed some stuff with him. Then they both left, stealing a bunch of random things. I called the police, and they got there several minutes later. The man and woman were long gone, though. The only thing I could do was give a description in my account of what happened. Luckily, neither of them came back while I was working again. A few years back, I worked at a hotel. When I started, I was working at the front desk during overnight hours. The hotel was pretty average size, maybe a little bit large. We don't have any restaurants or bars connected or anything like that, but have lots of rooms. I would sit behind the front desk, and most of the time overnights, nothing happened. Here and there, people would come or go, but most people didn't need to talk to me. This made my job really easy, and I didn't mind being up all night. The event that I'm going to tell you about occurred at just after 2 o'clock in the morning one night. I was working behind the front desk, and I faced the lobby and elevators. To my left, there was a lounge area and a hallway that led to rooms on the first floor. Everything was very quiet until a man entered the hotel. He walked inside and went right past me. I assumed that he was staying at the hotel and was just returning to his room. The guy was pretty average height, light brown hair, mid-thirties. He walked down the hallway and was gone. About five minutes later though, he walked by again, this time going to the other hallway. I still didn't think anything of it, but I soon saw him another time. He was once again walking past from one hallway to another. It was sort of behind me, but still in plain sight. It seemed a little bit odd, but there was nothing wrong with it. But several minutes later, I went to go get some water. There was a dispenser in the lounge and you had to walk past the hallway to get there. As I was passing by, I noticed somebody in the hallway a ways down. I looked and noticed that it was the same guy. He was standing outside of a door, and it appeared as though he couldn't get inside, but was trying to. I thought maybe he was locked out of his room, or possibly he was trying to get into somebody else's. I started to walk over to him and was going to ask him if he needed help with something. When I got a few steps closer to him, he stopped and looked at me. Before I could say anything, the guy turned and then walked away in the other direction. Then he disappeared around a corner. It was really suspicious. I started to figure that the guy probably didn't even have a room here. I went back to my front desk and decided to look at the security monitors. We had cameras in every single hallway. Unfortunately, the video quality was honestly quite bad. Many details were hard to make out. I looked around until I spotted the guy on one of the cameras. He walked past it down a hallway. Then he went to a door and appeared to try to open it. It looked like possibly he was knocking on the door then or something. He was standing at it for a while. Then he paced around a little before returning to the door. This was too suspicious and I decided to go ask him what was going on. I got up and walked over to where the guy was. The hallways could get a little bit complicated on the first floor. The second and third floor was very simple, but the first floor had more hallways. I walked to the one that the man was at. When I reached the beginning of the hallway, I saw him. He was a ways down, probably almost a hundred feet. Almost as soon as I was within sight of him, he looked over to me. I asked him what he was doing. The guy just started sprinting towards me then. He appeared to be running as fast as he possibly could. This wasn't what I was expecting, and I moved back and started heading towards the front. The guy was still running and quickly approaching me. By the time I got back to the lobby, he was a lot closer. I could hear him running. I decided to run out of the hotel and see if the man would. After I made it outside, I realized that he did in fact follow me out, and he was also a lot closer than I expected, now only about 40 feet away probably. I didn't think that I would be able to get to my car on time if he was chasing me. So I ran across the street. Across the street and a little ways down was a 24 hour gas station. So I ran all the way there and when I got there I went inside. The guy hadn't crossed the street and stayed in the hotel parking lot. I think he went back in the hotel after that, but I called the police. 
I reported a suspicious man trying to enter hotel rooms and chasing me when I confronted him. The police were very quick to respond and got there only like a minute later. They entered the hotel, which the man was still inside of. He tried running away, but was caught and removed from the hotel. He wouldn't say what he was doing there or why he was trying to get inside of rooms. After that, I talked with police for a while and then returned to work. I was really creeped out by the whole situation, but grateful to be all right. That was an experience that made me want to stop working overnights, and I did shortly after. Last night, my boyfriend and I were driving home from Universal Studios in Orlando. We were rerouted a way home we've never went before and were traveling in basically the middle of nowhere. My boyfriend's speedometer is broken on his car and he has to press the button to reset the miles after he gets gas. This will be very important soon. We were driving on a deserted road in the middle of absolute nowhere without a single car in sight. My boyfriend realized we hit the 130 mile mark on his odometer. We needed gas but there was literally not one gas station in sight. I put search gas stations nearby and we found one. It turned out to be closed. In a hurry, we found another gas station five minutes up the road. This is where the story gets weird. My boyfriend thought he closed his gas cap and were once again driving along this deserted road. We heard a loud bang and he realized he forgot to put the gas cap back on. So we're driving around this dark road looking for the gas cap. He finally pulls over and realizes somehow the gas cap is still attached to the car. We get back on track to the other gas station. Out of nowhere, I had a horrible thought about something going wrong at that gas station. I pushed it aside because I knew we needed gas and AAA is not an option where we were at the moment. We get to this gas station and the lights are kind of on. This road literally leads to a dead end with a gas station on it. The only way to leave this area was to turn left or go straight out of the gas station. My boyfriend got out of the car to see if we could get gas and the feeling intensified. I have literally never felt like that in my life. My stomach dropped into my butt. I have been in very disturbing situations such as almost being kidnapped twice, being followed home, watching someone be taken away in a body bag after being hit by a car, and even a paranormal situation. But I have never felt like this before. I saw a white car pulling up to the road to make a left. Keep in mind there is literally no one on this road. He pulls up and notices my boyfriend and backs up with his windows down. I found this very strange because my boyfriend has a very nice sports car, and my mind immediately went into panic mode. I started screaming his name, and the man realized that someone else was in the car, turned left and sped off. Sadly, I didn't get his license plate because of how dark it was. This situation frightened me more than you can even imagine. It may not seem too scary, but it was easily one of the most terrifying things to watch, because I didn't know if I was going to witness my boyfriend being robbed at gunpoint or something like that. The feeling and thought I had just 10 minutes earlier is what also made the situation even worse. We found a gas station with actual human life around and we made it home safe and sound. Once I got home, my dad told me that the road we were driving on was famous for the many bodies being found on it. I hope no one ever gets put into this situation. And to the man who was planning to do something to my boyfriend, let's never meet. This happened in Antioch, California. It was around 2 a.m. I was at a friend's house, safe in warm, sheltered suburbia. We were having a lot to drink, chit-chatting, enjoying ourselves. Of course, when you're having fun, time hits the fast-forward button, and those few minutes turn into an hour. I had too much to drink. My friend has a bit of an abrupt bedtime, so I had to dodge out early, still intoxicated. I felt too shameful thinking I would be asking too much to stay in his house, to sleep off the drunkenness. I suppose he was either too rude or too drunk to consider it himself. Whatever. Sometimes a little inconvenience makes you appreciate everything else. I needed about another hour or so to sober up and drive back. As fast as time passed during my stay it decided to drastically slow down as soon as I stepped out of his house. It was a cul-de-sac area, a concrete jungle with the stem of the street breaking into a fork. Alongside the road, my car was parked. 
The only street light that worked was in the middle of the cul-de-sac circle, about 80 yards away. I stumbled towards my car, produced my keys, felt the metal line up, opened my door and shifted to the back seat. Because this was a dark, strange, and unfamiliar neighborhood, I took the leftover newspapers and a sweater in my back seat to cover myself up. I wanted to camouflage myself and not just be some guy awkwardly sitting in his car, waiting for time to pass in order to drive home. I couldn't fall asleep. The uncomfortable feeling of a cheap backseat bed enshrouded in darkness didn't make the chance of slumber easier. It felt too ominous. And of course, my mind began to wander. I thought of worst-case scenarios, like how the police would shine their lights on me through the window, or a drunk driver hitting my car, and... Wait. In the distance, about 100 yards away, I could hear footsteps approaching. The gravel scuffed with each step forward, growing in proximity, but periodically taking stops. I wondered why, until it made sense in my mind. Whoever it was was probably looking through cars carefully, with the intent to steal one. I couldn't recall how many cars were on the block, but I counted three full stops until he was at my window, breathing. I froze. There was no more than one foot between us. The car encapsulated me as I lay hidden beneath backseat clutter, forming myself into an object, trying my hardest to be unnoticeable, unmoving, and simply not there. I see you, said a 40-plus-year-old man in a perverse baby talk. Imagine when you were playing hide-and-seek and one of your friends tricks you into coming out. He said it in that tone of voice, as if baiting me, like he was questioning whether the clutter in the back seat was just clutter, or a person. I did not want to move or check the window. I remained clutter. Give me an Academy Award. My body reacted by minimizing my breathing so much that I felt paralyzed. I dare not look. My eyes fixated on the back of the passenger seat. I did not blink. I did not move. I did not breathe. My heart was pounding so hard it shook my body with each throb. He circled around the car. My ears didn't fail me. I heard the steps. I felt like I was part of the car. I could feel him touching the trunk as he carefully pressed down on it as if to test the alarm, as if to test me. I was in the middle of fight or flight. I couldn't do either without elevating danger. I was frozen and hoping that he was bluffing. He circled the car again. The door handle to my right jiggled. He was pulling it multiple times. I see you same tone, but more agitated and stressed, more convinced that he was trying to make that clutter move, revealing itself to be of his expectations, that it was me. My muscles tensed like a cow before slaughter. Tap, tap, tap. That had to be metal against glass. Take a penny right now and tap your window. A crowbar. A knife. A rock? My eyes fixated on the seat in front of me, never averting my gaze, like he was. I was covered enough to where I couldn't see beyond the seat in front of me. I know I couldn't see him, but I could feel his eyes resting on top of me. My name is Poker Face. What's your name? The voice changed in a lower, demented, and serious tone. My mind forced a visual. It wasn't anything human. I already accepted my death. I was ready to be shot in the head, ready to take a life-changing bullet, multiple knife wounds, 
just make this sleep bearable, not excruciating, as you drain me of life. I wouldn't know how to react. My thoughts grew dimmer. I imagined my friend waking up the next morning after a calm night of safe and sound sleep, only to discover my mutilated, defiled, and bloodied body hanging outside my car door. It was then I heard nothing but my own heart. What was this person doing now? Just staring at me in the middle of the night? Talking to me? Or a messy pile in the back seat? Time froze. The footsteps were being swallowed in the distance. He left. I waited another hour until the sun showed hints of itself. I jumped in my front seat and bolted out of there, wide-eyed and sober. So this happened to my family in early 2002 when my daughter was a baby. My wife and I moved into a new house right after our daughter was born. It was a nice place in the suburbs. I would rather not mention in what city. The house was relatively new and surrounded by other houses with the same exact design and layout. We were still getting used to our new life there with our new baby, when one night, we heard the baby crying on the baby monitor. We were watching a movie in the living room, paused it, and went into the baby's room. The baby wanted her bottle. I stood in the doorway of the room while my wife tended to our newborn. I was smiling at the sight of this, when suddenly my wife made a small sound of fear and surprise. She was looking out the window directly beside the crib. I walked over to her, and she didn't say anything. I looked outside and saw a woman that looked to be about our age standing on our lawn and looking into the bedroom window. I went into protective mode and immediately walked out of the room and towards the front door with the intention of confronting her. My wife shouted before I could open the door. She ran away! I ripped the door open and walked outside. I looked around the front of our house and walked a bit further onto the street, looking in both directions. No sign of her. I decided to walk around the whole exterior of my house to make sure this creepy lady had really left. I walked the perimeter of our house and didn't find her anywhere. I returned to my house to find my wife still holding the baby in our master bedroom, and I told my wife that I did not find her. After a little while of being creeped out and looking out the windows to make sure she wasn't still lingering around, we decided she was gone for good and went to sleep. The next day, we saw the woman again, this time at night. And this time, my wife was in the shower, and I was holding our baby in her bedroom. I saw the woman standing in the same spot on our lawn, peering into the bedroom at me holding my baby. I just looked at her for the longest time, and she didn't move. My wife eventually walked into the room with a towel in her hair and approached me from behind, giving me a hug. I said, She's back. Look. She's just standing there. My wife got incredibly creeped out at this point and insisted that we call the police. I was going to, but felt I wanted to confront her again. So I walked out of the room and opened up the front door, which was only about 10 feet away from the baby's room. I walked outside, and the woman was still there. She turned to me. I walked onto our lawn about 20 feet away from her and said, What are you doing? If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. If I ever see you around here again, I will call them immediately. The woman smiled at me and then opened her mouth wide and let out a nightmare-inducing scream that sounded as if she was in pain. I knew right away that this woman was ill, like in the head. She turned around and ran away. This was terrifying as I realized she was barefoot. She ran away like a little kid would, arms flailing. I went inside and my wife was already holding the phone. A couple police officers came by the house a short while later, 
and they said there was really nothing they could do except drive around the neighborhood a few times and keep an eye out for her. They said they would call us if they did see her. About 20 minutes after they left, they called and said they didn't see anyone fitting her description. We were disappointed, but eventually fell asleep. After taking turns looking out the windows for hours, I had assumed the woman got the hint. A month had passed, with no sign of her. Then one night, my wife and I were in bed, when I heard a noise. I awoke and glanced at the alarm clock. It read 3.32 a.m. I listened for the noise to continue, and heard giggling coming from the baby monitor. I sat up in bed and my heart stopped. I flew out of the room and into my baby's room to see nothing. My baby was asleep, and my wife had followed me. I was very confused for a moment and thought I didn't actually hear anything. Maybe it was just a nightmare. My wife asked what was wrong. I didn't respond for a few seconds and then finally said, Nothing. I thought I heard something. We both sighed and walked back into our room. My wife went into the room first and upon entering, screamed and then threw herself backwards into me. I gasped and almost fell backwards onto the floor. My wife started repeating, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My heart pounding, I replied, What? What? I forced my way past her and walked into my bedroom. The woman was sitting Indian style on our bed. I backed up out of the room and slammed the door. My wife ran and took our baby from her crib, and the three of us went outside. As I was closing the front door once we had walked out, I heard our master bedroom door open. Neither of us had our cell phones on us, so we ran to our neighbor's house and started frantically knocking on their front door. They answered very quickly and asked what the matter was. We explained, and they ushered us inside and called the police. The cops showed up shortly after, and they went inside our house. The woman was still there. They said they found her upstairs, sitting in the middle of the hallway, in the dark. I have a story I'd like to tell you all. This happened when I was 18, about 16 years ago. I was still living with my parents in their nice house in suburban Colorado. It was getting late one night, around 11.30 p.m. I was on the phone with my girlfriend and had decided to go up to my room and switch phones, using the one that was in my room, so that I didn't wake my parents that I now assumed were in bed. Voices downstairs echoed upstairs easily, and I had gotten in trouble for that a few times before. I told my girlfriend to hang on, that I was going to put the phone down for a minute while I went upstairs to turn on my phone. I set the phone down on the counter, right next to where it gets hung up on the wall. I quickly walked upstairs and into my bedroom. My room was cold. I left the window open. I slammed my window shut and picked up the phone next to my bed. All right, babe, one sec. I'm going to go downstairs real fast and hang up the living room phone. I set the phone down on my bed and went downstairs. I reached the last step, turned left, and stopped. The phone was now hung up on the wall. I stood there bewildered for about 30 seconds, a bit creeped out, but mostly confused. Maybe my parents came down and hung it up? No, that wasn't possible. I would have heard them, and I was only upstairs for about 30 seconds. I walked over to the phone and then turned around looking around the living room and into the kitchen. Nothing. No sign of my parents. Nobody else was in my house that night. I convinced myself that I must have hung it up before I went upstairs. Wait. No, that's not possible. Then I would have hung up on my girlfriend. I walked into the dining room and nobody was there. I walked back upstairs and over to my parents' bedroom. I pressed my ear to the door and could hear my dad snoring. What is going on? I walked into my bedroom and almost had a heart attack when I saw that my bedroom phone was now hung up 
I turned around fast to the dark hallway. Nobody. I ran downstairs into my horror. I saw the phone in the living room was now gone. I got goosebumps all over, and my heart was now pounding in my chest. I ran back upstairs and into my room. I ripped open my closet, but nobody was there. I walked over to my phone and picked it up. As soon as I did this, I heard somebody say, I came in through your bedroom window. I almost dropped the phone out of fright and thought, that's impossible. My bedroom is on the second story. I turned around again expecting to see someone, but did not. I turned and opened my window. I looked outside and saw a large extension ladder there, leaning on my house, just below the bottom of my window. I dropped the phone on the ground and ran to my parents' room. I slammed against their door with fists and yelled, Open the door, there's somebody in the house! My mom opened up and was confused, with a terrified look on her face. I went into their room and my dad was sitting up in bed. I locked their bedroom door and repeated myself, There is someone in here, they have the phone, they just said something to me. My mom ran to my dad's side of the bed and grabbed his work cell phone that was still in his jeans pocket. She called the police, and they were at our front door knocking around 15 minutes later. They searched the house and found no one. They did find the living room phone, though. It was lying in the middle of the grass in our backyard. Something very creepy happened to me on Christmas. I had celebrated the holiday that morning with my family and went to see my parents. On Christmas night, I had to go into work to finish a proposal I was working on for a new potential client. I obviously didn't want to go into work, but it had to be finished. My work was in a building downtown that is fairly close to a few nightclubs and bars. My office is on the 23rd floor, and in my position, I have an office, but most of this floor is filled up with cubicles in the middle. My office is in the far corner next to my boss's office. So to get to my office, I have to walk by all the cubicles. I didn't get there late, probably around 8 or 9, but there was nobody else there. This was my second time going in alone, and it was peaceful. If I let my imagination run wild, however, I would get spooked easily. As I walked the path next to the cubicles, I was reminded of what I was missing at home. While looking at all the Christmas lights strung up, decorating people's workspaces. There were no lights on, but it was lit up enough by all these Christmas lights. I reached my office and unlocked it. I went inside, but didn't close the door. My computer and desk faced away from my door so I couldn't see anyone that approached my door on work days through the huge glass window that I had. I found this annoying as I never knew who was knocking until I got up and opened the door. I sat down and began working as quickly as possible so I could get back home. After a while, I'd say about an hour into it, I heard the main entrance door close. I didn't hear it open, but when it closed it made a noise that was unmistakable. I wasn't spooked at this point, just curious as to who else was unlucky enough to have to come in and finish something. I got up from my desk and walked out onto the floor. I looked around, but didn't see anybody. I said loudly, Hello? Nobody responded. At this moment, I got paranoid and freaked out a little bit because I definitely heard the main entrance door close. Somebody was either here and then left, or was still in here and not responding to me. I was just about to turn around and get back to work when I saw a head sticking up out of a cubicle on the opposite side of the floor, looking towards me. I could see that it was a man, but I couldn't make out any details of his face. I thought he must be messing with me, so I shouted over to him. What a time to have to come in, huh? Hoping whoever it was would stand up and laugh. But they didn't. The man didn't move and this really scared me. So I tried again and said, I can see you, guy. 
he didn't move. I wasn't sure what to do next, and was now very on edge. So I felt through my pocket for my keys, and they were there. I started walking down the path towards the entrance door, the whole time watching this guy. As I was walking, he just watched me. I looked over at the entrance door for a second, just one second, and looked back. He was gone. After seeing this, I thought, Oh my gosh, he could be moving over to me. So I jogged the rest of the way to the door and went through it. I jogged over to the elevator and hit the button. I turned around quickly, and the door closed as it made the same noise as before. The door thankfully opened immediately, and I went inside and hit the first floor button. The door closed, and I did not see the guy come out that door. I drove home and told my wife what happened. I had to call my boss and tell him as well, so that I had a reason for not finishing my proposal that night. He was understanding, and I went back in two days later with everyone else. I never found out who the guy was or what that was all about. Nothing was stolen or tampered with, to my knowledge. This happened to me about 15 years ago. I lived near the ocean, and I frequented a certain spot on the beach all the time. It was a lonely spot, and not many people ever really showed up there. This one Saturday afternoon, I was laying out in the sand, in my spot, relaxing and tanning. It's not uncommon for me to fall asleep. I did sometimes if the sun wasn't too hot on my skin. This one particular day, I did. I woke up a while later to the sun now setting, and I realized I had slept for quite a while. I looked to my left and saw a woman sitting near me in the sand, but not a towel. She was wearing jean shorts and a bathing suit top. She had really pretty red hair. At first, I didn't really acknowledge her, but after glancing at her a few times, I noticed she was just staring out into the ocean and did not turn to look at me or anything for that matter. I felt a bit of curiosity and said hello to her. She said hello back, without turning her head to look at me. Right after that, she sprung to her feet and walked away. I thought it was kind of weird, but didn't think too much of it. I'd say about 30 minutes later I packed up my stuff and left. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and I had a great day relaxing there. Once I was home I started making myself dinner. I heard my phone ring and walked over to my purse on the counter and pulled it out. It was my mom. We started talking about the usual things. When I noticed a square folded piece of paper sticking out of my purse in the midst of our conversation, my mom continued talking and I pulled out the paper and unfolded it, confused, because I was pretty sure that I did not put it there. I literally dropped the phone when I read what was written on the paper. It said, I was going to rob you and stab you in the throat, but you just looked so peaceful. I picked up the phone and told my mom what happened, remembering the girl on the beach. We both nearly passed out. Hi, my name is Trevor, and this is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. This happened in May of this year. I'm a 22-year-old male who's in pretty good shape, and I'm a first responder, so I've seen and dealt with pretty much everything. I live with my parents in an upper-middle-class community. The town I live in has very little to no crime in it. So here's my story. My parents left to go to Florida to visit some family, and basically left me and my German Shepherd dog alone for the week. A quick layout of the house, it's two stories, with my parents' room on the first floor. Anyways, it's night out, and I'm sleeping in my parents' room with my dog. The bed is between two windows with screens on them. They were both opened. It's about 2 a.m. and I'm just getting ready to fall asleep 
when I wake up to the sounds of screaming. I think nothing of it since there's a lot of kids in the area who are always out. But about 10 minutes later, I hear the same screaming again, which woke my dog up, and he was also alerted. I still think nothing of it. Another 10 minutes, the screaming happens again, and I noticed it wasn't a child scream, and it was only one person. It was a loud screaming sounded like someone was getting stabbed. My dog starts huffing and totally freaking out. I'm now scared shitless and unable to move. Five minutes later, and the screaming was right outside the window. It was so loud this time that my ears started ringing. My dog flips absolute shit, and I'm having a panic attack. I look out the window, and I see some old woman with long gray hair, and she was still screaming. I finally jump into action, and I grab my dad's pistol. The only bad thing is that it was a revolver, and it had no bullets, so I had to pray she thought it was loaded. I went back to the window, and now she was gone. I dialed 911, and as soon as the operator answered, I then heard the front door glass break. I ran over, and I see this old woman reaching into the window trying to unlock it. The scariest part of all of this was that her arm was rubbing right against the broken glass, cutting her very deep, but she wasn't even reacting to it. She was giving me the thousand yard stare while laughing and screaming. <laughs> I'm literally crying at this point, and I had pointed the gun right at her. She sees the gun, and then just starts yelling. Do it! I dare you! And as much as I wanted to, I couldn't since I had no bullets. And then suddenly, I then see lights going down my street. The woman pulls her arm away and starts walking back slowly while still staring at me and laughing. I can then hear the cops yelling, Drop the knife, ma'am! The cops took my statement and I later found out that she was actually a psych patient who had escaped the hospital and that she even broke into a trailer nearby and stabbed a couple. The last I heard, they were okay, but why my house out of all the others? I had my door fixed and all the blood cleaned up. My parents later called me because they had heard that there was a break-in in the area. I had to tell them it was our house, but to not worry. To that crazy old who tried stabbing me, I hope you're getting the proper care and help that you need. Years ago, I was living in a relatively nice and quiet duplex and worked as a contractor for a small company. It was the winter of 2016, and while the area I lived in was lonely, I always enjoyed what I was grateful for in life. I won't name the town I was in, but figure the Ocala type area. Those who have been around there will probably know what I'm talking about when I say rural. Grasslands, rolling hills, and scattered forms of civilization amongst roads. While it got lonely at times, it wasn't always like that. I lived with my miniature dachshund Sadie, big bark, small bite, and was the most precious thing in the world. She was my comfort dog and would always be there for me when I was feeling down. One day, I had just got back from work and started up the stove to heat up some food. Midway through my cooking, I hear Sadie begin to bark at my bedroom door for some reason. Completely oblivious, I just assume it was her being bored and focused on dinner. However, she still continued to bark, even after I told her to stop. Assuming she just wanted to go into my room to play with her toy, I open my bedroom door and she basically flies in and begins to bark under my bed. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach as it was clear she was chasing something. At this point, she's going absolutely nuts, barking at something under my bed while trying to get under. Assuming it was probably a lizard or a roach, I grab her and put her out in the kitchen where she thankfully quieted down. My duplex is located right next to a wooded area, so it wasn't uncommon for small, unwanted critters to scurry around. 
No matter how many times the landlord called in the exterminator, the problem always persisted. After I ate, I put my plate in the dishwasher, got ready for bed, and went to sleep for about an hour before waking up to Sadie barking. This somewhat bothered me, as I had to work early and I couldn't sleep with her barking. As I sat bolt upright, trying to grab her, she then jumps off my bed and begins to bark under the bed again. Now I felt that she was trying to tell me something, and so I get up and look under my bed with my flashlight. Laying under my bed was the face of a man smiling at me with these abnormally large eyes. He was clearly older than me, I would estimate 50s, but I didn't see all of his facial features. He puts his finger to his lips and makes a shushing sound. That's when I scream my head off and yell at the person hiding under my bed to get out of the house. When I didn't hear a response or see him come out, I ran to the bathroom and locked the door behind me. For those wondering, yes, I took Sadie with me. The reason why I didn't go out the front door was because I had already locked it and my key was on the other side of the bed along with my phone. Within a minute, I could hear his heavy footsteps approach the bathroom door, followed by a light tap. He then proceeds to mess with the lock on the bathroom door, trying to open it with God knows what. Keep in mind that I haven't fully seen this guy, so I didn't know what he had on him. After some time of him trying to pick the lock, he says in a slow, creepy voice, I know you're in there. You know I could break this door down in two seconds, right ma'am? That was when I realized that this person was dangerous and that he wasn't going to give up that easy. The only thing I could do was to jump out the small glass window and out onto the street. Then, as if things couldn't get any worse, the window wouldn't move up due to the ice surrounding it. It was frozen shut, not knowing what else to do. I go into the shower and unscrew the shower head and use it to smash open the window. I go through first and trample onto the snow with my shoulders bleeding from the broken glass. I carefully grab Sadie, making sure she didn't get hurt, and from there we go over to the neighbor's house and call the police. The neighbors were hesitant before saying yes, but wanted to stay out of it as they didn't want to get involved. The police had come sooner than expected and went into the house and came out with the guy. However, he didn't try to get away. He kind of just went with it, accepting his defeat. After he was detained, one of the officers had come to me and told me something disturbing. The minute they went into my room, everything was wiped out. My bed, furniture, TV, and computer were all destroyed and ruined. Turns out, he had also managed to get in the bathroom by breaking down the door. The bathroom has one of those strong metal doors, so for him to break it down just shows how strong he was. The cops had given me some criticism about how I went about reporting this wrong, and that I shouldn't have locked myself in the bathroom. At the time, I felt that he was being insensitive, or blaming me for my wrongdoing. However, then I remembered that these were police and probably deal with situations like these every day. If I hadn't thought of the idea to break the window, God only knows what would have happened to me. Hurt, kidnapped, or worse. I haven't heard of the man since, and I had since moved out of that area. Sadie had unfortunately passed away in late 2018 due to a cancer tumor that I had caught during its late stage. While she may not be with me now, her soul still remains and I thank her for alerting me about the man. I love you, Sadie. I live alone in a somewhat busy neighborhood. This happened about a year ago. It was the winter time and I live in a climate that typically gets a lot of snow. Not only was there already some snow on the ground, but it was also very cold. One night, I was at home by myself when it started to snow a lot. I had heard about a large snowstorm that was supposed to hit the area, so I had no intentions of going anywhere. Luckily for me, I was working at home for the next several days. 
Pretty soon, the snow really started to come down. I looked out my window occasionally to see more snow each time. It was very heavy snowfall as well. Soon it was nighttime, and I was really glad that I didn't have to be anywhere. Occasionally, a snowplow would drive down my street, but other than that, it was very quiet. At probably like 7 p.m., suddenly there was a knock at my front door. I found this to be pretty odd. I walked over and looked out of the window. A young woman was standing there. I didn't see a car or anything, so I didn't know where she had come from. But at my house, from my front windows, I don't have a very good view of the street or even my driveway. I didn't know who she was, and she wasn't really dressed for the weather. She just had pants and a sweatshirt on, and appeared to be in her early 20s. I opened the door and asked her what she was doing out in this snowstorm. The woman asked me if she could come inside my house to warm up. Her story was that her ex-boyfriend kicked her out of his car and then drove off, or something like that. I asked her if there was anybody that could come and pick her up or something. She said that she had just called her mom, and she was going to come. I didn't really like the idea of somebody who I didn't know coming inside of my house. For some reason, I felt like it was a bad idea. But I did feel bad for her with it being a snowstorm and everything, so I allowed her to come inside. I told her she could wait right inside the door. When you enter the front door at my house, it's kind of between the living room and dining room. The front door is on the left side of the house. The living room is to the right and the dining room is straight ahead. After the woman entered, she made a beeline walking straight into the dining room. I was really confused, but I didn't say anything. I just watched her. She kind of said something quietly like, sorry, one second. Then she walked all the way to the back of the house and was going out of my sight. I started to walk closer to her to see what she was doing. As soon as I looked around the corner and saw her again, she was at the back door of my house and opening it up. My first thought was wondering why she was going back outside if she wanted to come inside so badly. But that thought was interrupted when I saw the door open and two men suddenly walked right inside of it. I couldn't believe it. At that point, for me, my instincts just kicked in. I instantly turned and ran the opposite direction. I ran towards my hallway where my bedroom and bathroom was. I heard multiple footsteps coming after me, but they were still a ways back. After I got inside my bathroom, I closed the door and locked it. But just seconds later, somebody tried opening the door. There were multiple people outside of my bathroom now. Nobody said anything though, including me. After the door wouldn't open, there were a few loud bangs on it. I got out my phone to call the police, but did not feel safe staying in the bathroom. So right after dialing 911, before I spoke to the operator or anything, I tried opening my window as quickly as I could. I probably did it in record time, and then I jumped out of my bathroom window and landed on a bush that was covered in snow. Then I ran through the deep snow in my yard and fell several times trying to run fast. I made it back to my feet quickly though and eventually I got around my house and to the street. I just kept running until I made it as far away from my house as I could. Then I was finally able to talk with the 911 operator. I said everything that happened and after that I walked down my street far away and waited until the police arrived. I didn't have a coat on or anything. But the crazy part is that I wasn't even cold at all. My adrenaline was going too much. When the police got there, the woman and the two men had taken off. I got back to my house to find it a mess. There was stuff all over the floor and a few things were stolen. It could have been much worse though, as I saw they didn't go in every room. They probably realized after I got away that they would have limited time before the police got there. I feel very lucky that I made it out safely. I'm not sure what those people would have done if I had stayed. Would they have tried to hurt me? I hope not, but I will never know. Since that happened, I don't answer my door to anybody that I don't already know. I also have installed a ring doorbell, which would have been nice to have at the time of the incident. I'm hoping nothing like that ever happens again. This story happened years ago when I was still in high school. During that time, I was pretty busy. I went to school five days a week and then worked a part-time job at a nearby restaurant. One time in the winter, I had heard all week that a big snowstorm was coming. It was supposed to hit in the afternoon, and this was not good because I had to work after school until 8 p.m. Luckily though, the snow held up a bit. It started just towards the end of my shift, and as I was driving home, it started to intensify. I was able to make it home safely though. And then it really started coming down. After I made it home, I did some homework and then went into my bedroom to play video games. 
It was a Friday night, so I had no school the next day. I also didn't have to work. My parents went to bed at probably like 10 or 11, but I wasn't planning on going to bed for a while. My bedroom was on the front side of the house and across and down the hallway a little bit from my parents. Usually, I had my windows covered, but on this night, I left the cover half open. I enjoyed seeing the snowfall and found it to be relaxing. So, I was there having a great time, just gaming in my room during a snowstorm, when something really strange happened. Something out of the window caught my eye, so I glanced out to see. What I saw was a man walking down the sidewalk in front of our house. He was pretty far away, but I didn't recognize him. I knew most of our neighbors, and I wondered what this guy was doing out walking at almost midnight in the middle of a blizzard. I kept my eye on him as he continued to walk down the sidewalk. But then he turned and began walking into our front yard. I thought this was really strange and I paused my game to see what the man would do. He then walked right into our front yard and then cut through the grass and went towards our front step. My heart started racing when I saw this. I was still trying to figure out what exactly was going on. He was now out of my sight though, so I carefully and quietly left my bedroom. I went down the hallway and then stopped at the end of it. I looked around the corner carefully. We had a large front window that had a shade over it, but you could still basically see people on the other side, or at least you could see their shadows. I didn't want him to see mine. He was standing at the front step, I could tell. I was expecting him to knock on the door or ring the doorbell any second, but he didn't. He was just standing there in silence. This went on for probably a minute or two. Then the man started walking away. He was going back through the yard and then he stopped at the window. I jumped back when I saw this. The man was standing right next to the living room window and possibly trying to look in. I really couldn't tell though. I quietly went back into my bedroom down the hallway. When I got in, I was listening closely if I could hear anything. After a few moments, I looked out of my window towards where the man had been before. He was gone now. I left my bedroom and went to the end of the hallway and looked out. I didn't see the man out the front window. He wasn't at the front step either. I was wondering where he had gone and hoping that he had left. I then went to each and every window and looked out all of them. Most of them were fine until I got to the back of the house. Before I looked outside the kitchen window, which looked out to the backyard, I saw the guy. I jumped back and I didn't think that he saw me. He was now standing on the back patio a few feet away from the back door. I ran back to my bedroom, terrified. When I got there, I was debating what to do. Should I call the police, wake up my parents, or just hide in my room and hope that the man would leave? Then, about a minute later, as my mind was still racing and thinking of what to do, I heard a knock at the front door. I went back out into the hallway and looked. The guy was now back on the front step. I was definitely not going to answer the door. The man did not knock again though. He stood there for several more minutes and then just turned and walked away. He left the front step, this time walking straight back. I went back to my bedroom and watched the guy walk back to the sidewalk and then out of sight. I still had no clue as to what he had been doing. I stayed up that night until after 2 o'clock in the morning. The man didn't return. Eventually, I fell asleep, and the next morning everything was fine. I told my parents about it, but they figured it was just a drunk neighbor or something. Maybe it was, but I know that was the most creeped out I've ever been. I still remember how scary it was to see him outside of our house. Luckily, he never came back. This story occurred when I was driving back home from work one night. It was snowing like crazy and had been for quite some time. I got off of work late, which was not good news for me, because when I got back to my car, I had to clear off all of the snow with a snow scraper and there was probably like three or four inches on top of it already. Then I got inside my car and left and quickly realized that the driving conditions were not safe at all. It was probably 10 p.m. at this point. I drove very slowly on the roads and there seemed to be hardly anybody else out driving. It would normally take me about 15 minutes to get home. This time though, I think it took almost 30. Basically the entire way back, I really only noticed one car and it was driving behind me. I don't even remember at what point it started to drive behind me, but I think it was pretty early on. 
each time that I turned. I didn't expect the car to turn with me, but it did. By the time I was almost home, I assumed that it was one of my neighbors. The roads were so slippery that you had to take every turn very slow. When I turned onto my street, the car behind me did as well at a very slow speed. I was pretty sure that it was a neighbor. There are a lot of other houses on my street and I don't know everyone. So when I got to my driveway, I turned and pulled in. The car following me kept going down the street. I have a garage at my house, but it's detached. I drove up to it and then opened the garage, drove inside and then closed the garage door. Then I turned my car off and got out. After that, I got my bags from the back seat. Then I left the garage to walk to the house. But as soon as I opened the garage door, I saw a car parked in my driveway. It must have been the same one that had seemingly been following me. I was really confused and didn't know what was going on. I made it between my garage and house and had to walk around to the front door. When I saw the car, I stopped for a second and thought about what to do. I couldn't tell who was driving the car because of it being dark out and the headlights, plus all the snow. I didn't know who it was or what they were doing here. Instead of confronting them or something, I decided not to. I chose to ignore them and walk right past. Looking back, it was kind of weird, but I just wanted to get inside. I figured they would probably drive away, plus it was snowing and it was safer inside. I turned and began walking along the front of my house to the door. When I was about halfway there, I heard the door to the car open. Whoever had been inside must have gotten out. I kept walking and didn't bother to turn around, and when I just about made it to my front door, finally decided to look over. When I did, I saw a man standing there next to the car, wearing a really creepy looking clown mask. It sent a shiver down my spine. I hurried and unlocked the door and then got inside. He didn't move though, he just stood there. It was really creeping me out, and after getting inside, I went to the other end of the house. I wanted to just ignore it. When I went back a few minutes later, he was gone. The car and the guy in the clown mask. I was happy to see that, but the whole situation still seemed really odd to me. Why would somebody follow me in that bad of a snowstorm? The driving conditions were terrible. Then he just stood there, staring at me like a complete weirdo. It's something that still leaves me wondering today. This happened back when I was a teenager. I think I was 14 years old, and probably a freshman in high school. It was the winter time, and sometime in the early evening. The sun had set, and it was dark out. We were getting a large snowstorm, and I was sent outside by my mom to shovel the driveway. She was cooking and said that food would be ready when I got inside. It was kind of my job to shovel the driveway and I didn't really mind it. When it was snowing this badly though, it could be tough. We had a pretty long and straight driveway and I needed to shovel it now even though it was still snowing. That way, the next morning, instead of having like a foot of snow to shovel, there would be less and it would be faster and easier. I went as quickly as I could and things were going pretty well. Our neighborhood was generally pretty quiet and not that many neighbors were outside or anything. We also lived on a cul-de-sac with only about 10 houses on it total, so I pretty much knew all the neighbors and their cars and stuff. When I had reached near the end of the driveway and was shoveling the last section, I heard a car coming onto the street. It entered our street and then came around the corner going very slowly. It was a larger and older looking black SUV. It looked to be a Chevy Suburban. I had never seen it before and wondered whose it was. It slowly drove past me as I shoveled and then went to the loop of the cul-de-sac. It went around there and then started to come back down the street. At that point, I guessed that it was somebody who was on the wrong street. They were probably just going to go back around, but they were going extremely slow. Then they started to slow down in front of our driveway and it kind of creeped me out a little bit. They moved past though, but then pulled over on the side of the street right in front of our house. It was only about 50 feet away from me. I wondered who on earth it could be. In fact, I wanted to just run back inside of my house right then and there, but I figured that would be weird and decided to just keep shoveling. The car sat there with the engine running and nobody got out of it. I glanced, but I couldn't see who was inside at all. It was not a good angle to see the driver, plus it was dark out and the windows were tinted. I shoveled, trying to hurry up and finish so I wouldn't have to be creeped out by this strange vehicle. The SUV then shut off but nobody got out. After probably two or three minutes of the SUV just sitting there, the door finally opened. 
I was now almost at the complete end of the driveway. I saw a man get out of the car, and then he began walking over to me. He was kind of tall and thin, and wore a black jacket and jeans. He also wore a winter hat, and had sort of long hair. When I saw that he was walking straight for me, I really wanted to just get out of there. I told myself not to though, and I shouldn't be afraid of people. The guy walked right up to me and said hi. I said hi to him, and was really nervous. The guy asked me if I wanted some help shoveling, and said that he could help me. I told him no thanks, and that I was just about done. He then asked me if I lived there, and I said yes. He just stood there for a few moments as I finished up the shoveling. Then he said something that really creeped me out. The guy asked me if I wanted a ride anywhere. I asked him why. He said, I could take you anywhere you want to go right now if you want. I was really confused by this. I said no to the man and that I was supposed to go inside now. I started to walk away. The guy stood there and watched me as I started heading back. When I made it about halfway up the driveway, I heard him walking back to his car. It was a relief. When I made it back inside, I told my parents about the guy. We looked out the window, but he was gone now. This was one of the stranger things that had ever happened to me. But that night, I stayed up kind of late. It was probably like 10 p.m., and I looked out of my window and noticed that the SUV was back. I really couldn't believe it. I kept my eyes on it and could see that the engine was running. The same man was probably inside, and I was hoping that he wouldn't get out. I really just couldn't believe that he had come back. He was parked in the exact same place as before. Then, after about a minute, the truck drove away. I went and told my parents. My dad went outside, but the man was long gone by then. After that night, I never saw the truck or the man after that. The story still gives me the creeps when I think back to it, though. I don't know why the guy came down our street or what he was doing. I'm really glad that he didn't try to make me go with him or something. Looking back, I probably should have gone inside as soon as I saw the car parking in front of our yard. Sorry, but be prepared for a fairly long story. Here goes. I was living in Hawaii and had to move to LA for work. Didn't know anyone and was fairly broke, and my job wasn't going to help with the moving expenses. So I had to resort to scouring Craigslist for a room to rent. After literally thousands of scams or weirdos, I finally find this amazing girl. She was funny, we had similar interests, and she even worked in the same field as me. She didn't have a place yet, but her and another girl were looking at several houses that required a third roommate. They were totally okay with doing all the work, seeing as how I was an ocean away. She called or Skyped with me about once a week, and sent me pictures of each house they looked at. All in all, she was pretty incredible. Fast forward three months, they found a huge and gorgeous house. Everything was settled. The two girls, Evan and Juliana, were moved in. And Evan, the original girl from the Craigslist, picked me and all of my stuff up at the airport. On the ride home, she starts telling me horror stories about her past roommates. Every single one had f***ed her over in some horrendous way. And she was terrified of being close to people after that. She said she wanted us to be the people who turned that around for her. And she wanted us to be like a little family. Instead of going directly to the house, we went to a nearby Starbucks where she chain smoked and told me about her stepdad who was in AA and how she'd briefly been attending NA meetings after a short bout with a painkiller addiction. She decided she wasn't a drug addict and didn't need it. Then, she admits that she's only known the other roommate for a month and a half. Red flags are starting to pop up all over the place. Why would an LA native need to find strangers to live with her on Craigslist? Why the oversharing about drugs in her family? Why had she never had a positive roommate experience? Push it all aside, giving this girl the benefit of the doubt. A few weeks go by in the house and all's well. I forget she ever seemed off and we start becoming closer and closer. She then takes me on a tour of LA for a day and proceeds to tell me her entire disturbing life story. When I say we gotten close, by no means were we close enough to make this appropriate. She tells me about her stepfather molesting her, getting sent to a mental hospital when she told on him because he's a doctor and she said she was criminally insane, then getting raped by a lesbian at the hospital and beaten by the guards, 
then attempting suicide, as well as her mother's severe narcotic addiction. Her then ex-fiance having a psychotic break and trying to kill her, her struggles with chronic kidney illness that required many surgeries, her recent long-term boyfriend disappearing under mysterious circumstances. The horrific stories just went on and on and on. It sounded like something from a movie, and part of me questioned if it could all be possibly true. But again, I was giving her the benefit of the doubt. Things go fine for a while, and my doubts about her subside. And my food starts disappearing. I ask both girls about it privately, and Evan claims that the other girl, Juliana, had confessed to her that she was a compulsive overeater. Naturally, Juliana claims to be innocent. I side with Evan, and we start mildly bullying Juliana to try to get her to admit that she was stealing the food. And the dishes start piling up in the sink, and nobody is washing them except me. I ask both girls, and again, Evan swears on her life that it's Jules. Finally, Jules has had enough. It turns out she's been eating out every meal. We all had very different schedules. And Evan lied to my face about the dishes and food. When confronted, Evan starts crying and saying, How could you accuse me of such things? I'm a good person. I'm a good person. We ended up apologizing to her in the end. Finally, tension builds between the two girls due to many, many, many repeats of the situation. And one night, when I'm at work and they start fighting, Evan calls me saying that Juliana hit her and she's afraid for her life. I call Jules and tell her to find a new place to live. Juliana goes to stay with friends, and within a week, she moves out. Now this is where things get really, really weird. Evan moves out of the master bedroom and starts sleeping in the living room every single night. After I repeatedly request that she return to living in her own bedroom, she tearfully confesses that she's been on high-dose opiates this whole time. She's trying to wean herself off, but it makes her too weak to walk downstairs. Feeling sorry for her, I end up babysitting her for a few weeks while she withdraws. It was both terrifying and disgusting. I really wanted to help her out. During this time, I see her naked and realize that she has no scars from her quote-unquote repeated surgeries. Beyond that, she confides in me that she hasn't been working at all this entire time, but going out to score drugs and get high every single day. And now, she's flat broke. She apologizes for lying and saying over and over that she's a sick, sick addict and just needs help. I get her into AA and NA as soon as she's able to walk, driving her to her daily meetings and holding her hand the entire time. My longtime boyfriend and her oldest friend move in with us a short while later to help with the bills. That's when it all goes from bad to unbearable. Evan goes to visit her mom one night and disappears for a week returning very clearly high and claiming to be sober. She then starts going on many trips to visit friends in other states and is rarely home. When she is home, she babbles endlessly about how great sobriety is and how she's finally healing while clearly nodding out on opiates. I end up finding something suspicious on her computer and she openly admits to me that she's been working as a call girl, bringing customers to our house. I tell her this has to stop and she claims she already has. Around this time, she becomes very, very physically ill. Finally, I get a phone call from her after another absence. She's hysterical. She's, get this, six months pregnant. She didn't know because she was so high. The baby was severely malformed, and there was no way of carrying it to term. I tried comforting her thinking that this trauma outweighed all the weird behaviors she's exhibited. She had the procedure and afterwards disappeared for almost a month. I thought at one point she was dead until she texted me asking if a cat was okay. When she returned, she proceeded to start eating all of our food, using all of our toiletries, sleeping on the couch, and smoking inside the house, which was not okay with us at all. She was very clearly on drugs again. At first, we tried to be nice about it, but she lied and lied and lied. Even going so far to say her room was haunted and the ghost made her sleep upstairs. Finally, my boyfriend snaps and yells at her. She calls the cops and claims he assaulted her. They didn't believe her, but the other roommate did. 
Then one night when I'm at home, she uses pity and sweet talking to convince my boyfriend that we should all be friends again. I told him it was a lie, and he didn't believe me. When I get home from work that same night, my room is trashed. I asked if he did it, and of course, he claimed he didn't. She'd been in there looking for cash or drugs, which I don't do. When I asked her about it, she looked me straight in the eyes and said, It was a ghost. After that, she started sending me insane emails, claiming that I'd been her best friend and betrayed her, accusing her of heinous crimes, and even convincing her that she was a drug addict as a form of a sick psychological torture. The emails get increasingly intense, becoming 10 to 20 pages about how she didn't feel safe in her own home, and how I was the embodiment of pure evil, and that my only purpose in life was to torment her. In these emails, she claimed that she used drugs on rare occasion, and that I'd made everything about her problems up, and that I'd been verbally abusive about her abortion, and that we had repeatedly physically assaulted her. We were genuinely afraid for our safety, especially after the police showed up one day and took her in for a mysterious psychiatric hold. We never found out why she was carried out of the house, barefoot and handcuffed, by four LAPD officers. After that, we just tried to avoid her, but she got that other roommate evolved again. She went as far as to claim that she had pneumonia from the stress of living with us, and our constant abuse. The emails continued to escalate. At one point, she said that I had been a sister to her, until the evil spirit in me had forced me to abuse her. This was when I realized that her definition of abuse was a bit skewed, and all her stories about her childhood, exes, old roommates, and even Juliana had been complete fabrications. Of course, she didn't have scars from the surgeries. Everything she said was a lie, just to garner sympathy so she could take advantage of people. Now I realized this of course, finally, and that she was completely mad. We found a new house and the night before moving out, I hacked into her email. Come to find out, she had been telling our landlord that we were heinous criminals, telling her parents that she had been fired from a job because of me and needed money. All kinds of lies. Also, we came to find out that the guy who gotten her pregnant didn't mysteriously disappear. He ran away because they slept together once and she started stalking him. Obviously, everything she had ever said was a creepy little lie. To moving out, the harassing emails and texts continued to the point that I have her blocked on both and seriously consider getting a restraining order. This was two years ago. Last month, we found out this girl who had claimed to have never been a drug addict and that I made all of it up and died of an OD. She was evil. This wasn't a situation where nobody tried to help a sick person. Everyone around her tried to help her and she manipulated and used every single one of them. I don't feel sad that she's gone. In fact, I still want to punch her in the face. TLDR, my roommate decided to be a drug addicted, lying, stealing sociopathic prostitute who semi-stalked me via email and text. Okay guys, yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've ever endured, and it all started with a phone call at about 7am. I picked up my phone to see who was calling me so early, but since I didn't recognize the number, I just put it on silent and fell back asleep. When I woke up again three hours later, I saw that I had 12 missed calls and 8 new voicemails. Panic started to set in as I thought something horrible had happened to one of my family members. As I looked through all the missed numbers though, I realized that I'd didn't know who any of these people were. I thought that was really strange since if something bad had happened to a family member, I should at least recognize one of these numbers. Things got weirder as I heard the first voicemail. Hi, I was just giving you a call about the house you have for sale. I saw the Craigslist ad and was hoping to figure out a time I could be given a walkthrough. Just give me a call back, thanks. I figured that was the wrong number and played the next one. Yeah, hi. I was calling about the house for sale on Craigslist. If you could, give me a call back. I'd really like to know some more stuff about those murders before I take a walkthrough. Thanks, and have a nice day. After hearing the second voicemail, I was really starting to wonder what the hell is going on here. The other six voicemails were all pretty much the same thing. Inquiring about setting up a walkthrough, and wanting to know about these quote-unquote murders. 
After I finished listening to the last one, I needed to find out what the fuck is going on. I called the last number to leave a voicemail, and a woman answered. When I asked her about the house she was calling about, she said there was an ad on Craigslist offering a house for dirt cheap, but it was only so cheap because the post said that a couple had been murdered inside the house. I asked her if she could text me the link, and she assured me that she would. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed and I saw her number pop up on its screen. I had no idea what I was in store for by clicking on that link. So when the webpage opened, the coldest chill I've ever felt shot down my spine. I saw a picture of my house on Craigslist for sale. What made it worse was it was the picture that had been taken within the last week. You could see the pumpkin that I carved last weekend. And then I read the posting description. I have this sweet little home that I'm putting up for sale. It's located in this town. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the city. Enjoy all the seclusion and privacy that this house will bring you. My asking price is $25,000. Disclosure. There is a reason I'm asking basically nothing for my house. The previous couple who lived there, a young man and a woman, were murdered in the house about a year ago. I figured it would get out in the open now so that I'm only contacted by people who are not bothered by this. Don't let this little mishap dissuade you, though. The neighborhood is very safe. I promise. You can call. Then they listed my name and number at any time, day or night. I never sleep. And we can set a time to take a walkthrough of my house. I look forward to hearing from you soon. With a winky face. I felt like I'd been socked in the gut. What the f*** is going on? How did they know my number? My name? I immediately called my girlfriend over to see. I could see the horror set in on her face as she looked through the ad. I don't think I could feel any worse until she pointed out how our car was in the picture. We were in the house when someone took these pictures. I immediately called the police to figure out what the hell to do. They informed me that I should immediately contact Craigslist to remove the posting. Other than that, there was nothing really we could do at the moment. The only crime that had technically been committed would be trespassing, but since whoever took that picture wasn't on our property anymore, it really couldn't do anything else. I'm freaking the hell out. My girlfriend was on the phone with her mom in hysterics for most of the day yesterday. Today, we've just been on constant alert. Every sound we hear makes us jump. I think the worst part is, I know there's really nothing I can do. I feel so violated, and so completely helpless. A couple of years ago, I responded to a Craigslist ad for a TV. I was in the market for a new one after mine broke, and unfortunately, I hadn't gotten the warranty for it. I searched on Craigslist because I figured that's where the best deals would be. People on Craigslist are generally just trying to get rid of stuff, and will sell it somewhere else if they want more money. That's what I was thinking, so after searching for a while, I found a TV that looked good. It was 55 inches, relatively new, and was a good price. Not so cheap that it looked like a scam, but cheap enough that it was a really good deal. I saw that it was a new listing, and I decided to contact the seller immediately so that nobody else would get it before I had a chance to. The seller responded to me rather quickly, and I asked to look at the TV. I had the money and was prepared to buy it as long as it worked and everything, but my main problem was how I would bring it back to my place. My car was really small, and there was no way I was going to fit it in there. My buddy Danny had a truck that it would fit in, so I texted him and asked him if he would help me out. Meanwhile, I was told that I would be able to see the TV that day at 3 p.m., and I agreed to go see it. My hope was that Danny would be able to possibly meet me there with his truck, but a few minutes later, he wasn't responding to my text. I had to leave, and I drove to the location I was given to. It was about 15 minutes away from where I lived. I got to the neighborhood, which looked pretty average to me. It was a residential area that was a little bit out in the country, but not too much. Most houses were decently spread apart with larger yards and a decent amount of trees around. I arrived at the address and parked on the side of the street in front of it. It was a nice looking house with a long driveway. They had some nice decorations outside and a garden in the front yard. I texted the seller letting him know that I was there and he told me to come up to the front door. I got out of my car and walked up the driveway then knocked on the front door. A man answered and said his name was Dave. Dave had gray hair and a gray goatee. He was maybe in his 50s or 60s. He told me he was selling the TV because his son gave him one, and he just wanted to get rid of this one now because he didn't need it. 
He then told me that he had some other people interested, so we hoped I would be able to buy it. After I saw the TV sitting in his living room and we turned it on, I told him yes I would like to buy it, but I wouldn't be able to drive it to my place. I explained how I texted my friend, and then I checked to see if Danny had gotten back to me. He had, but he said he wouldn't be able to help me until tonight. I asked the man if there was any chance he would be able to hold the TV for me just until 8pm when I would be back. I was surprised, but the man agreed, but he said he wouldn't hold it any longer. I left and went back home, and when Danny came by with his truck that night, I texted Dave, the seller, and he said it was fine for me to come and buy the TV now. Danny and I drove back to Dave's place, now at night time. When we arrived at the neighborhood and made our way to the address, I got confused. Dave's house looked different. All of the lights were off, the yard decorations were gone, and even the flowers were gone. It looked as though it was a completely different place than a few hours earlier. Danny shut his engine off and had already gotten out of the truck. I got out and told him to wait because it just didn't look right. Danny was confused and asked why as he began to walk up the driveway. I told him how it looked like nobody lived there now and he did agree that it seemed creepy. I called Dave to let him know that I was there now, but after I called him, there was no answer. I texted him as well, but I couldn't get a response. We got back in the truck and sat in there waiting for about 15 minutes, but I didn't get any responses from Dave. I figured maybe he sold it to somebody else after all or something, and we decided we should just go back home. I was frustrated, and I was also really weirded out by the whole situation. That night, I was awoken in the middle of the night to my phone ringing. I picked it up and saw that Dave was calling me. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to answer it because I was really curious why he was calling me now. When I picked up, I could hear Dave's voice start to speak, but I couldn't make out anything that he was saying. He then began to laugh like a maniac and it really gave me the creeps. His laughing got louder and louder, and then he hung up. It took me a while to get back to sleep, but I was so creeped out by the whole situation that the next day I drove all the way back to the neighborhood. I knocked on Dave's door, but nobody answered. The house still looked abandoned, so I went to the neighbor across the street and knocked on his door and asked him if he knew the guy who lived there. He told me that nobody currently lived in that house and hadn't for a couple of weeks. After learning this, I went back to Craigslist and found that the listing had been deleted. I also looked at my phone and tried to call and text Dave again, but my number was now blocked. Okay, so I've posted this on the sub before and I was just thinking about creepy encounters I had. And it struck me that this one probably qualifies as kind of creepy. Hopefully I'm right. This happened about a year ago now. College student, and I was basically forced to move out on my own, which I didn't mind. That meant finding a new roommate, which can be daunting and a scary experience. I've had a few weird encounters, but I think this one takes the cake. I posted on Craigslist looking for a bedroom in a shared house or apartment for 300 or less. And on my ad, I mentioned, please no phone calls, only text or email. Because I find being on the phone with someone I hadn't had a chance to size up a really uncomfortable situation. Just awkward, I guess. Anyway, I get a call from a dude who clearly didn't read the no calls part. Which I mentioned because this type of phone call was exactly the reason I don't like to talk to strangers on the phone. At first, he was just pleasant and normal told me he had a room available, and relevant information like that. We start to talk about when and where we'd like to meet, and he started going on tangents about random things. A combination of interested and deep conversation, and too awkward to end a call when it starts to get kind of weird. So this call went on for two hours. We talked about the meaning of life and all kinds of weird shit. Honestly, this should have been the red flag. And I shouldn't have met with him, of course, I also should have grown a pair and told him I needed to leave. So, he wants me to meet him at his place and show me the room. Since learned that you should really insist on meeting in a public place first. I get to his neighborhood, and it was run down on a level that made the ghetto I grew up in look nice. Saggy front porches, hot cracked concrete, sad people with old beat up Lincolns, you get the picture. His house blended right in. The yard was seriously overgrown and the front door didn't work. So I went around the back and just looked at the guy standing in the doorway. Seeing the kitchen behind him was enough to make me realize that I really just wanted to leave. No way in hell. 
The guy in the doorway was a man with a sort of clown-style afro. He was leaning on a cane on his right side. His eyes looked crazy, and the house smelled musty from ten feet away. Again, I'm a coward, so instead of trusting my gut, I go inside this house, and I'm polite, thinking, it's okay, it'll be over in twenty minutes, and then I can get the fuck out. I don't know what made me think this man, who had a two-hour conversation with me on the phone about life and philosophy, would let me get away that easily. He took me up a flight of creaky steps into a small bedroom with no door and a mattress on the floor. I thought, no way in hell would I live with a 40-something year old man, and I was a 19 and a female, with no door on my bedroom. But it was a moot point because my mind was made up before I even saw the room. I wouldn't have lived there for free, let alone $200 a month. Things got weird. He tried to hold me hostage with conversation again. I think he was lonely. He talked about how some of his family were millionaires. He might have been delusional. The whole story seemed made up. He told me about an 18-year-old girl that has also checked out the room and tried to fuck him. And told me about how his mom hated white people. He was black and I was white. And it sounded like he sympathized with her. Obviously, that made me even more uncomfortable. Eventually, I was able to find a break in the conversation plucked up the courage to make up an excuse and leave. I was never so happy to leave a place in my life. I don't know that he was necessarily a rapist or anything like that, but he really gave me the f***ing creeps. I used to work as an event coordinator at the Swan and Dolphin Resort slash Convention Center. Sometimes we'd have to get there at really early hours of the day before the union laborers showed up. This was to get everything ready and set up for special events and stuff like that. One day, one of my managers had cut my hours due to a budget decline in the company. This resulted in me not making as much money as I used to, which caused me to fall behind on rent. Therefore, I had to start making some money until I could either get more hours or find a new job. Eventually, I began to sell some items on sites like Craigslist and eBay, which added to my income. It wasn't much, but it was enough to financially support myself through this time. At the time, I was in the process of selling a specific type of radio from the 40s that was worth a pretty penny. It was my grandpa's radio, and I guess it somehow got passed on to me after he died. I've gotten several offers for it, but the majority of them were people trying to lowball me for prices too small. At one point, however, I get a message from a guy who seemed really interested in it who was willing to offer me $500 for it, which was more than the listed price. I of course accepted the offer, and he then told me that he could come after 5 after he got off work. This was actually better for me, as I'd be out until 4. Anyway, 5pm rolls around, and a few minutes after, I get a knock at the door and open it. Standing at my doorstep is an older looking man, maybe late 50s, tall, with a long grey beard. To describe him a little better, He looked like a biker you'd commonly see in country movies. In a very deep and raspy voice, he says, Uh, hey there, I'm here for that radio. I happily let him in and show him the radio sitting on the kitchen table and even got him a snack. Oddly enough, he immediately begins inspecting the condition of it and even went as far as checking the inside. After what felt like forever, he puts it down and says he'd do it for 300 as the condition wasn't the best. Needless to say, of course, that $500 deal was out the window. He then stares at me with this intimidating look where I felt like I didn't have a choice. In the end, I had to agree and did the deal with him right then. Mind you, I'm a petite 5'7 girl, so I wasn't going to try and argue with someone like him. He gives me the money, puts the radio in his car, thanks me, and drives off. I wasn't sure why, but something about him just gave off a negative vibe which made me glad he was gone. 
The rest of the night was normal, where I had been watching a movie in my bed when my phone rang. The call was coming from an unknown number, but the area code was the same. Without thinking much of it, I pick up and immediately recognize the voice on the other end. It was the man from earlier calling me to thank me. What he said, however, will forever be burned into the back of my mind. Hey Sally, uh, look, thank you so much for your hospitality and kindness. If I'm being completely honest with you, I was planning to kill you with a knife I had in my back pocket the second I walked into your house. But you, you were just so kind, I, I just couldn't pull myself to do it. Take care now. Right then, my mouth draped open as humanly possible with all these thoughts racing through my mind. If I'm being honest with you, I wasn't sure what to do other than to process as to what I just heard. I would have called the police, but I later found out that the number he was using was fake from an app. That basically meant that even if police were to track the number, it wouldn't lead to him. After that, I removed the listing from Craigslist and never touched the site again. As scary as this was, I never received any updates on his identity or if he's in jail or not. There are seriously some crazy people out in the world who are willing to do anything to you. I emphasize that you please be careful when selling or buying something from sites like Craigslist. You never know who's out there and what they're capable of. This happened when I was in my mid-twenties back in 2012 when I was living in Sarasota, Florida. I had just graduated from college and had gotten a job in IT as a software engineer at a really good company. Because of this job, I was able to move out of my parents' house and get an apartment. It wasn't big, but it was spacious enough where I could store most of my stuff. When moving out, odds are you'd probably have a few items left over that you no longer needed or wanted. Well, I had the same situation and had some things I didn't need that I put up for sale on Craigslist. At the time, Craigslist was booming in popularity where people were buying and selling left and right. One of the items I had listed was this large tote I had used back when I played sports. It was in pretty good condition and I figured I'd snag a deal on it since sports were popular in my town. I'd say within a day, I had gotten a message from someone nearby interested in the tote. He seemed nice, didn't live too far, and was willing to pay more than what I was listing it for. Being so close to me, he'd offered to just meet me at my apartment, which would make for a smoother transaction. I'll be honest, I was a little uncomfortable, knowing that him, a complete stranger, would know where I lived. That being said, I brushed it off and told him I'd do it. Later that night, I hear a knock at the door and was greeted to a man who looked to be in his mid-thirties with this Swedish accent. He immediately goes to hug me, telling me that it was a nice way of saying hello in Sweden. Being a gay guy, I didn't really mind it and thought it was a kind gesture. He hugs me for a good 10 seconds before letting go and asking me for the tote. I gladly give it to him, and he then proceeds to pull out a hundred dollar bill and hands it to me, making sure our hands touched. It was a little uncomfortable, but I dismissed it as something people always did in Sweden. He thanks me, hugs me again, and walks down the hallway to the exit. Now let's fast forward till about two days later. I happened to be sick on this day and had called off work to rest. As I'm taking a nap in my room, I hear a heavy knocking on my door, which abruptly awoke me. I opened the door and was greeted to two police officers and the property manager. Confused, I asked what was going on, to which they then asked if I knew this person. The property manager showed me a photo of a man on his phone who just so happened to be the guy I had sold the tote to. 
I told him yes and explained that I had sold him a bag, but that was all I ever knew about him. They take down my name, my description of him, and what he ever said to me or did to me. Whenever I asked why they needed that information, they informed me that they couldn't tell me as of now. That being said, they leave, and it wasn't until a few days later where I had finally gotten my answer. Turns out, the man I had sold the bag to had been wanted for owning 23 terabytes of CP. To put that in perspective, a single terabyte is equivalent to a thousand gigabytes. This meant that he had about 13,000 hours of content downloaded. When I was told this, I was beyond disgusted knowing I was talking to a predator, a wanted predator in my home. The tote I had sold him was to keep certain documents that contained information on how to cover his tracks. Obviously, this plan never went through as he did end up getting caught in the end. I was interviewed for about a week by police before my complete shock slowly got back to normal. After that, I deleted my entire Craigslist account and decided to not sell anything else. Anyway, that's my story, and I hope you can take this as a learning opportunity to never trust people online. This took place when I was 10 years old at my local Chuck E. Cheese's. My mom had promised to take me as I had gotten all A's on my report card, and every time I did... I'd get a prize or some sort of outing. I've been to Chuck E. Cheese my whole life, and every kid knows it was their hangout spot. At the time, my family and I had been tight on money, so my mom agreed to take me, but that we couldn't go over the $50 limit. While it was a sucky situation, I didn't care about the money and just wanted to have fun. I remember my mom sitting down at one of the booths waiting for our pizza and giving me tokens to go play some games. I had been playing skee ball, the typical old but gold game. As I'm playing, one of the balls I had fell on the floor when I see an arm pick it up. As I look up, I see a man standing in front of me while handing over the ball. He wore a white shirt black pants, and an obviously fake Rolex on his wrist. To be honest, he looked like a dad, and I kind of thought he was at first. He introduced himself as Robert, and asked if I was alone. When I tell him I wasn't, he immediately says that he enjoyed skee-ball as well, and wondered if he could join me. I give him a friendly smile, giving him the hint that I didn't want to talk to him as I took the whole stranger danger thing seriously. He then says, You know, my son enjoys this game as well. Let's go play with him. He's right over there. He then proceeds to grab my hand and sort of nudge me to follow him. However, something in my gut told me not to go with him no matter how innocent he might have seemed. He tried slightly tugging me, but I just kept resisting, making it clear that I didn't want to go with him. This thankfully got the attention of people, which made the man start to get nervous. One of the bystanders had yelled out for him to let me go. One bystander turned into another one, and then another one, which ended up becoming a whole scene. At this point, multiple staff and police had rushed over. This made him finally let go, and he then tries to run toward the exit doors where he was eventually caught by police. I see this man trying to resist arrest to the point where he eventually got tased. The sound of his crazed screams will forever be burned into my mind as he lay down being put in handcuffs. My mom had taken me away where she had spoken to the police and the head manager. Turns out, this wasn't the first time he's ever done this before. He's actually done this to several other kids and had even managed to take off with a few. Before you ask, yes, the kids were apparently found and safe. 
The Chuck E. Cheese had apologized for the situation and even offered a full refund. However, my mom wasn't having it, practically shielding me as we left the building. My mom was extra cautious with me for the next few years until I could learn to fend for myself. Needless to say, we never returned to that Chuck E. Cheese again. This just goes to show you how Chuck E. Cheese isn't always a place where a kid can be a kid. So, I've worked at Chuck E. Cheese for almost four years now as a standard cast member. It's a pretty fun job overall, with the exception of moderate chaos at birthday parties and management. Every week, there were different managers, some good and some bad, so it really depends on who you get. Other than that, it was decently reasonable. Throughout these four years, I had dealt with many different kids and seen some stuff you wouldn't see at any other establishment. But this experience takes the prize. One day, some of our staff had been let go for reasons I won't go into, leaving us with a skeleton staff. This basically meant that there were barely enough employees to fully operate the center. While we may have been short-staffed, it had been a relatively slow day, which certainly reduced some stress. It was around closing time, and so we all had to clean up everything in a span of an hour. Now, this was around the time where COVID was still in its prime, so all staff was required to sanitize everything in the store. This included stuff like games, tables, counters, and even parts of the animatronics. After sanitizing and sweeping most things, I head into the back room where all of the animatronics were. Upon approaching the room, I immediately noticed that the door leading into the room was slightly opened. This was weird as both my manager and I were the only two people on site that had access to this room. I had assumed she had just maybe went in for something and forgot to lock it. As I walk inside, I begin to notice that the animatronics had seemed to have been tampered with. Assuming that they had to have been misplaced by my manager or something, I begin wiping them down while listening to my music. As I'm cleaning the inside of Chucky's head, I look to my right and sitting down is a man giving me a dead stare. I call for my manager, frantically screaming that there's someone in the back room. The man then slowly gets up and proceeds to forcefully put his hand over my mouth. Being a 5 foot 7, 140 pound girl, I couldn't escape his grasp no matter how hard I tried. It then came to a point where he leaned in and said that if I didn't stop, that he'd kill me. I try my best to calm down while bawling my eyes out, not knowing what he was gonna do next. My manager, along with the outside security guard we have, entered the room. The security guard draws his gun, demanding he let me go and to put his hands up. He complies, and I nearly run straight into my manager's arms while hugging her. Our well-fit security escorts him out of the center, where police were then called. It turns out that this man had gotten a hold of a spare key in our office area when it was unattended. There were also high amounts of zinc phosphide found in the suits. It's a very dangerous rat poison and can be toxic to humans if breathed in or consumed. I could only assume his plan was to attempt to poison the staff who wore the suits. To make matters worse, he was also found with a large knife in his back pocket. It was that night where I quit right then and swore never to return and my manager politely understood. However, I still have several remaining questions as to what had happened. How did nobody see him get a key? What were his intentions? And what would he have done had the security not been there? It still gives me goosebumps till this day. My name is Ron, and I've been an electrician for about 30 plus years now. What I do is basically repair any electrical errors that may occur in several establishments. 
These establishments ranged anywhere from schools all the way to malls. It's a pretty chill job for the most part if you knew what you were doing, but other than that, I enjoyed it very much. Throughout my years of work, I've never really had any sort of abnormal encounters, but that all changed in just one evening. One day, our company had received a call from a Chuck E. Cheese, reporting an issue with a few of their lights. On that day, I was scheduled to go in and fix them, which shouldn't be too much of a problem as lights were my speciality. I arrive at the Chuck E. Cheese, which had been closed due to a staff-only meeting. After inspecting the lights, I go inside the ceiling trying to figure out if there was something in the ceiling causing the issue. Being a big guy and going into small spaces was really uncomfortable, especially if you were in a rush. I'd say a minute after of getting this feeling, I hear what sounded like footsteps coming from across the ceiling. I shine my light in the dark, empty ceiling, only to find nothing. At first I thought that it might have been some sort of animal, considering this was next to a wildlife preserve where this was home to unwanted critters. So there I am, attempting to repair the issue when I hear it clear as day, the laugh of a small child echoing through the dark. <laughs> However, the only problem was that I couldn't see anyone or anything, even with my flashlight. There was seemingly nobody inside this ceiling, but me. I ended up repairing the lights and packed up my equipment and got the hell out of there. On my way out, I tried my best to forget about what I had just heard and to focus on what's next. I didn't bother saying anything to the staff or anyone at my job for that matter, thinking they'd see me as crazy. But then again, can you blame them? Till this day, I'm still unsure what it exactly was that I heard, but fear was not enough to describe what I felt. To be honest, I don't know what I felt. It was sort of a mix of fear, confusion, and panic. While I didn't talk about this with many people, I did speak to my friend who claims that it was all in my head. However, I was certain it was not. When I was a kid, I went to Chuck E. Cheese a number of times. It was pretty popular back then for kids to go to for birthday parties or for whatever reason. I always loved going there and every part about it was cool. But one time, when I was about 8 years old, that all changed. I was invited to my friend's birthday party and it would be at the local Chuck E. Cheese. He was a friend of mine and classmate from school. I think his name was Ben and we weren't really that great of friends, but he invited like 20 people. The party was that Saturday, and the neighborhood that I lived in was really close by to the Chuck E. Cheese. In fact, I could walk there if I wanted to. So, on Saturday, my parents actually did in fact let me walk there. It took me under 10 minutes, and our neighborhood was very safe that I was aware of. I don't remember any crime happening or ever feeling scared to leave my house. I got to the Chuck E. Cheese and was one of the first kids there. I talked to Ben, and pretty quickly a bunch of other kids started showing up. After that, I don't remember a whole lot. We were just playing arcade games, eating pizza, and drinking soda. It was a pretty fun time, just like any other experience that I had at Chuck E. Cheese as a kid. There were other people there too, but for my friend's party, they had rented off a little room of space. He had cake as well, and the party lasted for probably two or three hours. Then, when people started to leave, I decided to go home. I remember I told Ben's parents that I was going to walk home, and they offered to give me a ride. I told them how close I lived, and they made sure that my parents knew I was walking home, but they said it was okay. So then, I left. I was happy to walk back by myself, because it made me feel older than I actually was. And when I walked home on that day, everything was fine. I took the sidewalk past the Chuck E. Cheese and behind it. That led right into the residential neighborhood that I lived in. Then I just walked a few blocks and only had to turn once. It was still daytime, and just seemed like a regular Saturday to me. I don't remember noticing anything out of the ordinary. I made it home, and after getting there, I don't really remember what I did for the rest of the day. Probably just the typical stuff of watching TV or playing video games. I lived with my parents and younger brother in a one-story house 
that wasn't really that big or small. I went to bed that night, and this is where things get really creepy. I had my bedroom all to myself, and my window was next to my bed and looked out to the backyard. At some point, in the middle of the night, I woke up. I'm not really sure why I did, but when I did, I was really groggy and kind of looked around my room wondering what time it was. I then sat up to look at my clock slash radio that was on my nightstand next to me. It was then that I realized something was outside of my window. My blinds covered the window, but they were open partly. Then I remember looking over to see a large Chuck E. Cheese mask. It was the mask of the mouse and somebody was standing there wearing it over their head and staring into my window. The feeling that I got when I saw it was the most scared I had ever been for sure. I was also shocked and I just couldn't believe it. It was so random and bizarre. I moved back and got off of my bed. Then I ran away and into my brother's bedroom. He was fast asleep and I just kind of stood in there for a while just inside the doorway not knowing what to do. Eventually, I went into the living room and turned on the TV. I didn't want to wake anybody else up, but I also didn't want to go back into my bedroom, and I couldn't sleep. I don't recall hearing anything else strange, and I didn't see the guy for the rest of the night. Eventually, I fell asleep on the living room couch. When my parents and brother got up, they asked me what I was doing on the couch, and I remembered the whole thing and told it to them. They were confused, and I think they believed me, but it was just such a weird situation. I even questioned myself many times if I actually saw what I think I did. I definitely was not half asleep though. I know that I was wide awake. We went outside and saw something extremely creepy. Just below my window on the grass, there were some Chuck E. Cheese tickets. I never saw the guy again or experienced anything like that after. I wonder if it was somebody from Chuck E. Cheese who followed me home or something. To me, that makes the most sense. But like I said, I didn't notice anything unusual. Still to this day, I'm left with many questions about that experience. When I was a kid, one of my classes in school won a field trip to Chuck E. Cheese. I don't remember at all how or why we won it, but I know that we were all very excited. I had only been to Chuck E. Cheese one previous time, and I think I was about 10 years old back then. When it was time for class that day, we all met in the classroom and then walked out to the bus. I remember that it was a great feeling leaving school during a school day to go to Chuck E. Cheese. We rode the bus for about 10 minutes to get there and then we went inside. This Chuck E. Cheese was located near a strip mall at the local shopping area for our city. It wasn't very busy being a weekday during the daytime and there was probably about 20 or 30 of us kids total. We all got a number of tokens to play the games and there were a few pizzas for us as well. We all started running around playing the arcade games and stuff. It was turning out to be one of the best school days of my life to that point. But I remember that about 30 minutes in or so, I was looking for a new game to play. I just kind of wandered off to the corner by myself just to see everything that was over there. That particular area didn't have a whole lot, and there was nobody else really in that area. I walked past a couple of those car racing game machines, I think. Well, between them and another game, I saw a grown man crouch down like he was hiding. He was really hard to see, and I'm surprised that I even saw him at all, to be honest. When I did, I first started to walk past, but I realized I saw somebody and I stopped. Then I went closer to examine and see if there actually was a man there. When I did, I got within about 50 feet of the guy and he turned and looked at me. I gave him probably a confused look, but didn't say anything. He then smiled and put his finger up to his mouth, signaling me to be quiet. I guess this guy was playing hide and seek with maybe a kid or something. It seemed really weird, but I didn't think too much of it. I kind of nodded back to him and then left him alone. I kept moving, trying to decide which game that I would play next. After not finding anything in that corner that I wanted to play, I started to move back over to the other games. But not far from that area, I found a game and started to play it. I was at that game for maybe five minutes or so. At one point of being there, I happened to look over to the quiet corner that I had been at before. I don't know why, but I just did. It was near where I had seen the man who had been hiding, but now I saw the guy again. He was standing up and with a girl who was not in my class. She appeared to be younger than me, and at first I figured that she was his daughter, but I noticed that they were walking towards the emergency exit, and the way the guy looked I just had a bad feeling. Something just wasn't right and I decided to walk over. I had no plan and didn't know what I was going to do or say. I started walking straight for the guy and he then saw me. What happened next was really surprising. He had been holding on to the little girl's hand 
and then he let her go. Then he walked towards the exit door and left. The girl remained inside, standing there. I guess it wasn't an emergency exit, because no kind of alarm or anything went off. But the guy was now gone. I walked over to the girl and asked her if she knew that guy. She didn't say anything to me, but shook her head no. After that, I walked with her back over to my teacher and told her about what had happened. The man was long gone, though. I'm not really sure what else was done, because I went back over to the arcade, and I don't remember a whole lot of details after. But I'm glad that I saw the man both times. Something about him just seemed suspicious from the start. I trusted my instincts, and my instincts were right. This is something that happened almost 10 years ago now. It was 2015, and at the time, I was a divorced mother of a 10-year-old boy. I enjoyed spending time with my son, and we would do fun things together all the time. One night, I took him to Chuck E. Cheese. It was fairly busy, and there were a lot of other people there. My son always loved going there, and I would usually just sit at a table as he played the games. He was old enough that I didn't need to always keep an eye on him, so I sat at one of the tables and went on my phone. On this night in particular, I was pretty much by myself at one of the tables. My son was in the arcade somewhere, and nobody was sitting immediately near me. At one point, though, a man came up and sat at my table. I didn't see where he had come from. I just noticed when he sat down, and I looked up to see him there. He looked to be around my age, so roughly late 30s, and had really short, blonde hair. I was a little bit confused by why he was sitting at my table, and I looked up at him. That's when he just stated that his kid loved Chuck E. Cheese. I said that mine did too, and we talked very briefly about our kids. I don't remember much of what he said, because I was still confused as to why he had come up to me in the first place. He must have sensed my confusion, because he then stuck out his hand for me to shake and introduced himself to me. He said that his name was Dave, and I gave my name to him. Then he said that he better get going, and he got up and walked away. I watched him walk back into the arcade and out of my sight. The whole encounter was a little bit strange. I stayed where I was for probably another 30 minutes or so. I didn't see Dave at all for the rest of the night. After my son had used up all of his tokens, he came over and got something with his tickets and then we left. It was the next day that I was on Facebook when I saw that I had a friend request from a guy named Dave. At first, I didn't know who he was, so I clicked on his profile. I then realized that it was the same man who had talked to me at Chuck E. Cheese the previous night. This was kind of weird, because I had only given him my first name, and I wasn't really sure how he found me. We didn't have any mutual friends or anything. There wasn't a whole lot on his profile as far as information or pictures either. I don't really know why, but I accepted his friend request. Unless it was obviously a robot or something, I would kind of automatically accept everyone. But that proved to be a mistake, as only about an hour later he started sending me messages. He started out by saying hi and asking what I was doing. I wasn't interested in talking to him, to be honest, and I didn't respond. He kept sending me messages, though. By the next day, there was about 10 more unread messages that I had from him. I finally decided to respond and asked him why he was sending me so many messages. He replied saying because I wasn't responding. He then asked me if I wanted to hang out with him, and I told him no thanks, and that's when his mood started to change. He started cursing me out and calling me things that I won't repeat here. I told him that if he didn't stop messaging me, I was going to block him. That's when he said something that really made me worry. He said something like, go ahead, I know where you live. It gave me the chills to read it, because based on his behavior, I thought that maybe he did somehow know. He then said that he didn't even have a kid. I blocked him and reported his account for harassment to Facebook. I just hoped that that would be it and I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. For a few days, I didn't hear from Dave, or see him at all. But then, one night, he came to my house. Luckily, my son wasn't home at the time and was at a friend's house. It was probably about 8 or 9 p.m. and I would be leaving to pick up my son soon. There was a knock on my front door to the house, and I knew instantly based on how late it was that it was probably Dave. My heart was racing as I walked over to look out one of the front windows. He knocked on the door again as I saw him standing there. I wasn't going to answer it, but soon he started yelling. I heard him say that he knew I was home and to open up the door. I was thinking that this guy had to have been crazy or something. He started looking around to the windows and I quickly moved away. I knew that this was grounds to call the police and I got my phone from the counter and dialed 911. 
as I was talking to the operator. Dave started yelling something else, but I wasn't paying attention to him. I was told that a police officer was in the area and would head over. I figured they would be there in a couple of minutes, and I started to feel better. Meanwhile, Dave kept knocking on the door. He was clearly angry now, and I heard him yell at me that if I didn't open the door for him, he was going to break in. That's when the relief that I felt went away, and I was just as worried as I had ever been. I still didn't bother to say anything back to Dave, though. Instead, I moved into my hallway and entered the bathroom. Then I closed the door and locked it, and hoped that Dave wouldn't actually try to break in. The bathroom had a small window that faced our backyard. At first, when I was in there, things were quiet now that I was farther away from Dave. I could barely hear the knocking, but then the knocking stopped. Probably about two minutes later, I then heard noises coming from the backyard. It sounded like Dave was possibly banging on the kitchen window. This only lasted for a few seconds though, and then it stopped. I didn't hear anything for a few minutes after that. The next thing I knew, I got a call from the police, saying that they were there. I left my bathroom and saw several officers outside of my house with flashing lights. They had actually caught Dave, and I was told that he had been hiding in my backyard. I pressed charges against him for harassment, and later got a restraining order. I'm happy to say that I've never seen him since then. The first and only time I ever went to Chuck E. Cheese was back in the year 2005. I was a little kid at the time, and I remember that my older brother got invited to one of his friend's birthday parties, which was going to be at the Chuck E. Cheese. My parents were invited as well, so they said that I could come with. I was excited to go there because I had always wanted to. It seemed like so much fun with the arcade games, the pizza, and everything. I remember that the party was on a Sunday, I think, and when we got there, my parents got a pizza, and my brother went to hang out with his friends. I knew some of the kids that were there, but they were mostly my brother's friends, so I could kind of do my own thing. My brother's friend who the party was for was named Tyler, and his parents got a bunch of tokens for everyone. They gave me a little paper cup with a bunch of tokens in it, and I began going around playing some of the machines. I was trying to find the best machines that would have the best payout of tickets. I saw that the Chuck E. Cheese had some pretty cool prizes you could win with the tickets. After playing maybe half the arcade games they had in there, I found this one in the corner that I really liked a lot. I was getting on a winning streak, and after the second time playing it, I had quite a few tickets and played it for a third time. I was right in the middle of the game, when all of a sudden, the whole thing suddenly went black and froze. It was really strange. I pushed some of the buttons and messed around with it a little bit, but nothing worked. The screen was completely black, and nothing I did seemed to affect it. I was a little kid, so I didn't really know how the machines worked, but I just figured it was broken. Then, I saw a man appear next to the machine. He was wearing a shirt with a Chuck E. Cheese logo and asked me what had happened. I told him the machine was broken, and he took a look at it and saw how it wasn't working. He pushed a few of the buttons and then went around to the back of the machine. It seemed like he was working on it, and a short time later, he returned and said that it appeared as though the machine was broken and it would be out of order for a while. Then he apologized to me and told me he could get me the tickets that I would have won and some extra tokens for the trouble. I was glad to hear this because I would have already won a good amount of tickets from the game before it broke. The guy started to walk away and told me to follow him. We went off to the side of the room and then into a hallway which led to the back. I stopped at the entrance of the hallway that said employees only, but then I was told to keep going. I followed the guy down the hall, and then we reached a side door. The guy then backed up and grabbed my arm tightly. He opened the door, which turned out to be an exit of the building. I could see outside, and he pulled my arm and forced me to follow him. I asked the man what was going on, but he didn't answer me. I was starting to panic. The guy had a strong grip on my arm, and it looked like we were going out to his car. I really didn't want to go any further, and I was desperate. As we got closer, I suddenly took my leg and kicked the man right in the groin area. It really took him by surprise, and he dropped to his knees for a second, and his grip became much looser. I pulled away from the man and started running back, but I decided to go around to the front of the Chuck E. Cheese. Once I had made it around to the front, I went in the entrance doors and ran back inside to my parents. When I got there, they saw me and asked me what was wrong. After I told them what had happened, they decided to call the police and talk with the managers as well. I remember I had to talk with the police for a while. Looking back at that day, I realized that the man didn't work at Chuck E. Cheese at all, and he most likely just unplugged the game I was playing himself.
If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. I used to work at a Chuck E. Cheese. I enjoyed the job a lot. It was a fun place to work. Maybe because I had a lot of good memories of going there as a kid. I would do a little bit of everything there, including quite a bit of maintenance and cleaning. One night, I was working on a quieter evening. I was in the process of cleaning up a table area when I saw a customer approaching me. I stopped what I was doing and saw that there was a pretty average looking guy standing in front of me. The guy told me that he had just been in the men's bathroom in the back and he wanted to let me know that it was really dirty and could use a cleaning. I told the guy thanks for letting me know and then he walked away. Keeping the bathroom clean was one of my jobs, and it wasn't one of my favorite parts of the job, but it actually usually wasn't that bad. After I was done clearing the table, I walked down the hallway to our little cleaning closet where I got a cleaning cart that I would use for the restrooms. By this time of night, the place wasn't too busy, and there were only a few kids and parents in the arcade or eating areas. When I got to the men's bathroom in the back, I went inside and saw that it was empty and nobody else was in, which was good, but when I looked around, everything seemed fine. I was happy to see this, but also confused. The more I looked around after going all around the bathroom, I saw that it was completely clean and nothing was dirty at all. After that, I took my cart and went to leave. But when I tried opening the bathroom door to get out, it wouldn't move. All I had to do was push it open, but it seemed like there was someone or something on the other side blocking it and holding it back because no matter how hard I pushed, it just wouldn't budge. I kept trying, but nothing was happening. Then suddenly, all the lights went out. It was pitch black in there, and I couldn't see a thing. I kept on trying the door, but nothing was happening. I started banging on the door and yelling at that point, hoping that somebody would hear me. Finally, after about a minute straight of this, the door suddenly burst open, and I went flying out there and fell flat on my face on the other side of the doorway. I looked around, but didn't see anybody nearby. I saw one of my coworkers, Jake, not too far away, kind of walking towards me. He came up and asked if I was okay, looking confused. I told him what had just happened to me. Jake said he had seen me go through the door, and he had heard somebody yelling, and that's why he was approaching the bathroom. He said when he got towards the bathroom doors, he saw a large man running away. I was really creeped out when I heard this. I actually looked around after that for the guy who had told me that the bathrooms were dirty, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I ended up just working the rest of the night like normal after that. But I've often wondered what exactly happened there. So the events of the story still make me think back to that night and I'm still trying to process what exactly happened. The events that took place on this strange night were about 10 years ago from the moment I'm writing the story. My friends and I were 17 years old and spent most of our weekends with each other, a habit that started back in elementary school, playing video games and sleeping at each other's houses. All through middle school and high school this was our weekend routine. At one point during senior year, we decided that we wanted to mix things up a little bit by taking a little night drive. It was myself, who had a license and a car at this point, and my two friends, Robbie and Scott. My parents trusted us because, all things considered, we were good kids. The night started out like most nights. Scott and Robbie showed up at the house to sleep over for the night. We ordered some pizza, played some games, and just talked about school for a little bit. Shortly after 11pm, we decided to go for a ride. For no other reason than to listen to some music and just exchange some good old fashioned conversation. We just drove for a while, turning down roads that we didn't even know existed, and before we knew it, we had been driving for several hours and I couldn't remember the last time we saw streetlights. It was extremely dark and desolate wherever we ended up driving. Around one, maybe a little bit later, we were driving down this really eerie and very poorly lit road when we approached a car that was on the side of the road. But it was not just parked on the side of the road, it was kind of somewhat crooked and the hood was tucked into the shrubs, almost as if though the car had lost control and got into an accident. 
The red taillights were still giving off a soft glow on the road, and Robbie suggested that we look in case someone fell asleep at the wheel or something bad really happened. If someone had got into an accident, it would have taken hours for paramedics to find them if we didn't do something right now. We slowly and cautiously approached the vehicle. It was an older red Honda Civic. We got out of our car slowly and began approaching this red car. Robbie said in this really brave voice, Hey, anybody there? Are you hurt? And there was no response. And as we got closer, I shouted, Wait. While we were walking over, I started to make out some type of figures in the back seat just sitting up. And Robbie shouted again, and this time with a bit of urgency in his voice. Hey, are you okay? Again, there was no response. No noise at all except for the motor of my car running several feet behind us. After a moment, Robbie finally said whatever and approached the red car, and we followed closely behind him, even though I felt something was wrong in my gut. We all were shaken with immediate fear as we went up to the window. There was, in fact, a person in the back seat, but almost more hauntingly, it was a mannequin, not a real person. And my first thought was, who in God's name would drive around with essentially a lifelike doll in the back seat? Admittedly, we got a good laugh out of this for a moment, but then the paranoia of this situation came back. Robbie continued to scream if anybody needed help or assistance, but there was still no response. And this is when I noticed that this mannequin had something in its plastic hands. It looked like some sort of tape, a VHS tape. Without thinking, I took the tape, and I didn't even tell my friends until later that night. We decided to just call the police, which we should have done in the first place, and we reported this abandoned car. The police asked for the license plate number, and that's when we noticed that there was no license plate on the car. Whoever ditched this car either didn't have plates or took those plates with them, and all they left behind was that creepy mannequin with that old VHS tape. So we made our statement and told the cops the location of the car and left. Later that night, while we were talking about this incident and just how crazy it was, and that's when I told my friends about that tape that I took from the car. In a sort of shock and perhaps a bit upset that I didn't mention it before, they of course wanted to watch it right away. On the sticker in front of the tape was this plain white sticker that only just said, Watch Me, written in black marker with very crudely drawn skull and bones. I had some pause, but decided that we had to watch it. Curiosity was getting the best out of all of us at this point, and I found my parents' old VHR in the crawl space and hooked it up to the TV. The tape began with about five seconds of a black screen and just the sound of a static tone. Then a man came on the screen with a beard and long hair. The quality of the tape was horrible. He stared into the camera, almost as if though he were staring right at us, and he wore a red flannel and sat at a table next to what appeared to be a workbench of some kind. He stared into the lens for two minutes straight without saying a single word. We watched the time and it was the most unsettling two minutes of my entire life. And after those two minutes, he laughed and then sort of morphed that laugh into a cry, all while staring directly into the lens and finally said in this sort of low, monotone voice, This tape belongs to me and I know you have it. I'll find it again and you'll be sorry. He then followed this with another horrible laugh and cry combo. We then fast forwarded the tape for several minutes and nothing else was said other than a few laughs and just this strange man staring at the camera. And finally it just cut to black and it ended. Now after a bit of conversation about this situation, being stupid kids we decided not to give the tape to the police. I just kept it. And after all these years the tape still sits in my bookcase. I'll never watch it again and I've never even really spoke about this event until now writing it down. And I'm sure this is just some kind of stupid joke, but to us kids, this was burned into our brains for years, and I'm still kind of scarred by the mental images that I witnessed that night. Every time I see a man that resembles that man from the tape, even after all these years, I still get that pit-of-the-stomach type feeling, 
and I'm reminded of that fear and paranoia that I felt in that evening. Why did he have a mannequin in his back seat? Why did he crash his car? And why did he have a tape there? I always had a really hard time focusing when it came to schoolwork. I've had some traumatic experiences in my life and as a result, it just makes me feel off. I can't focus at all when I'm home. Even when it's quiet, every little thing bothers me and I feel like I just read the same line a million times. In my sophomore year of college, I started driving to a secluded location and doing all my readings for school. I didn't live far from the country so it would only take me about 20 minutes to drive to a peaceful location. I found the peace and tranquility of nature to be soothing. I know it may sound crazy to some people that I would drive that far just to do homework, but I really had no choice. It ended up being the only way that I could concentrate on my work. When the end of my senior year was approaching, I started to freak out about one of my big exams. The exam was 40% of my final grade, and I needed at least a 75 on the exam to pass the course. I decided that I was going to spend the weekend before the exam studying and that I was going to make my own little adventure out of the experience. Instead of going to my usual spot, I was going to travel to an area a few hours away, hike the beautiful trails and find a nice quiet spot to study. I left first thing Saturday morning and arrived at my destination at around 10 in the morning. I spent the early part of the day hiking until roughly 2 in the afternoon. I found this amazing spot near the top of a steep hill. It was a clearing that overlooked a bunch of trees. There were some rocks on top of the hill and I was able to get comfortable with my books and computer. I started reading my textbook and I thought that I could hear the sound of twigs snapping. Now in my distracted brain, all I could concentrate on was the sound of the twigs. It was driving me crazy. I first thought that there was some sort of deer or chipmunk or something that was prancing around in the woods. I thought that I could go over and maybe scare the animal and whatever it was would just flee further into the woods and away from me so I could focus. I made my way over to the edge of the tree line and shouted some nonsense noises to try to scare whatever it was, but I heard nothing. I made a sound again, clapped my hands together, and again I heard nothing. I stared intently through the thick trees and I swear that I saw a silhouette of a person move but I figured that my mind was playing tricks on me. I kept looking for a little while longer and I realized that the noise had stopped. I thought to myself that whatever I did must have worked. I sat back down and started to read my textbook again, but now I couldn't concentrate because I couldn't help the feeling that something wasn't right. I flipped through the pages several times and once I realized that I wasn't retaining anything, I decided to pack my things up and head back. I was fairly far away from where I parked anyway, so I figured it was time to walk back and I would just find a spot to study that was closer to where I parked. When I walked over to the tree line, I paused instantly. Standing about 30 feet away, shrouded in the trees, was the backside of somebody. It appeared to be a man since the shoulders were so broad, but because the back was facing me, I couldn't be sure. They were dressed in all black and it looked like they were wearing something on their face. I didn't move or say anything. I just stood there frozen and tried to calm down since I had a million thoughts flying through my head. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably only seconds later, and the person turned abruptly, facing me. And I can't accurately express how much fear I felt in this moment. The mask was horrifying. I would guess that it was homemade since I had never seen a mask like this in my life. It appeared to be white, but also appeared to have a long snout hanging from the mask. It almost looked like a mask from one of those scenes in Beetlejuice, if anyone knows what I'm talking about, except somehow this was creepier in the moment. As I said, the mask was white and not skin colored like in the movie. The eyes on the mask were jet black and wild hair protruded from the mask. I think the hair was attached to the mask and not the person because it was sort of a mustard yellow color. The person started to hum, and I didn't notice it at first, and I didn't realize that it wasn't some melody. It was a really drawn out hum, like a sort of groan coming from this person, and they started to step closer to me. I freak out. The clearing that I was on was not big, so in order to walk back to the trail, I would have to walk by this person. I could have slid down the hill, but 
I probably would have broken my computer and most likely broken my legs since it was extremely steep and very high up. This person started to run, full speed at me, still making that horrible groaning noise. I still can't even believe what happened next. The person ran at me, stops, right in front of me. I'm frozen there. And they laugh. And then they just start humming again, but didn't actually lay a single finger on me. Not wanting to know what was happening or taking any chances, I just ran as fast as I could around them. The entire time that I was running, I could hear this person seemingly trying to follow close behind me, still humming, but I didn't bother turning around. I finally made it to my car, and that person was no longer following me. I tried calling the police, but of course, my phone service was pretty shoddy out there, and I drove several miles to the closest town. I called the police once I got there and reported what had happened, and I don't think they did anything since technically the person didn't do anything other than just disturb me and there were no other complaints. I have no idea what that freak was doing in the woods. I don't know if they were on something, playing some type of prank, or truly messed up enough to actually hurt someone. It seems unlikely that it was a prank since I didn't see anybody else in the woods and it seemed like we were the only two humans in the area. I realized I shouldn't complain since I was unharmed in the incident, but the psychological trauma that I felt, it still sticks with me to this day. I'll never forget that terrible afternoon and the memory of that horrible mask. When I was in my early 20s, I had a friend with a psychotic alcoholic father. She didn't live with him. She lived in a remote little coastal town. Now and again, we would go together to visit him and stay the night. My relationship with him was creepy in itself, but that isn't the subject now. One night when we were visiting, my friend and her dad had gotten into a drunken blow up. He kicked us out of the house. This was around midnight. And we got in a lift down and I hadn't had a car. My friend's dad lived about four kilometers out of town by the way of a dirt road. So we start walking down that dirt road back to town where there was a telephone booth. This was in the days before it was commonplace to have a mobile phone. I was going to call my folks, who lived about an hour and a half away, and see if they would come get us. The whole way to town, my friend was drunkenly moaning and crying about her broken relationship with her father, and she hadn't let up by the time we finally reached the phone booth. She sat on the bench next to the phone while I woke my parents up. They agreed to come and get us, and I sat down on the bench for a long wait. Shortly after this, a van appeared up and parked just behind the bench we were sitting on, maybe five meters away. There were two young men in the front seats and they were looking directly at us. If that didn't make me nervous enough, the van door slid open. Then I saw there were a number of young guys in the back. I don't remember how many exactly, but definitely more than two. The place that we were sitting at was completely deserted. There were no houses nearby just more road. No people, nowhere to run, no one driving by. It was a shitty little nowhere town. I stood up so I could see them better. I kept my eyes fixed on the van full of men, acutely aware of our vulnerability. What I saw was that they were looking back at us. They were talking amongst themselves quietly at first. Then they started talking more and more loudly, and it had now become evident. They were deliberately talking loudly enough for us to hear talking about pulling us into the van, taking us somewhere to fuck us and kill us. I can't remember the exact words, but that was the gist of the situation. My whole body was not shaking, but quaking with terror. I couldn't take my eyes off the men. I remember the face of one of them so clearly that I could draw it now. He was just sitting in the door of the van, looking at me with no expression, looking at me with dead eyes, looking at me like I was a thing. All this time, my drunk friend hadn't stopped sobbing to herself. Whether she knew the van was there or not, I couldn't say. I knew I had to tell her about that danger, but I was actually so full of terror myself, I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. That was when the most incredible thing happened. My friend's father, who has never apologized to anyone in his life, and who was the most awkward prick alive, appeared out of nowhere, drunk, in his car. It's hard to describe how unlikely it was for him to do this. 
He could hold a grudge like no one you've ever met. He was such a stubborn, stubborn man. And he and my friend had an emotional reunion. The whole time my eyes were fixed on that van still. The men had now stopped talking and were just watching us. Let's go, I said. We got back into the car and started heading back for my friend's dad's house. Then the van started up and they began to follow. I tried to explain to my friend's dad about the men, but he said, Slow down and they can pass. They slowed down to a crawl behind us. Then they began to shout out the windows, screaming more threats. They followed us all the way down that dirt road and then all the way down the driveway of my friend's father. They just sat in the van behind us and we sat in the car, waiting to see what would happen. All of my friend's dad's neighbors were holiday homes. And nobody was in that night. We all knew that if the men decided to get out of that van and carry out any of those threats, we would receive no help. Thankfully, after a very long time, the van backed out of the driveway and left. My parents came in a panic to the house when they couldn't find us at the shops. My friend's dad hid in shame, and I went back to my family's house. I've been asked if I went to the police, but I don't remember. I don't think I did. It was just a really messed up time in my life. But that incident changed me forever. I'm a very fearful person now. Very overprotective of my kids. And I don't want to change. Because I'd rather be like this than accidentally trust one of the millions and millions of psychos out there. I was a live-in caretaker for a 94-year-old woman with Alzheimer's for about a year and a half. She moved into her daughter's home deep in the woods in the middle of nowhere, Washington. Marie was prone to say weird things, like that her sister, who was deceased, mother, who was deceased, and husband, who was also deceased, were in the house or outside regularly. I myself had been working with dementia patients for years, so it never really got to me or bothered me. But Marie was terrified of those woods. She would always tell me how there's dangerous animals out there and how I could get lost easily so I must always stay inside. She was also worried about her mother and husband having to travel through them. Again, this really wasn't worrisome behavior given her health condition. I'd been working with her for about six or seven months when I would start waking up to her walking down the halls in the middle of the night. Sundowning is fairly normal for people with Alzheimer's, so... Again, I wasn't troubled by any of this. But she started going to a specific window and giggling, like she was interacting with someone outside the window. When I asked what she was doing, she'd say my mother is out there. Kind of weird, but there's a different perception in her world now. One night, in the dead of winter, her daughter and I are awoken to the blaring sound of the house alarm. The daughter and I at the doors and windows, none of which seemed to be disturbed or unlocked. The only thing missing is Marie. She's nowhere in the house. Panicked, I rush outside to find her, while her daughter continues to search the house. No tracks anywhere, no disturbed snow, nothing. After 10 to 15 minutes of yelling and searching the woods, I start making my way back to the house where her daughter already was in the process of calling 911. As I approach the house, I see Marie, standing outside the window she normally stood at giggling. There's not a single footstep in the snow around her, nor is she cold to the touch. She's just standing there, laughing at nothing, didn't even know she was outside. Her late night window visits became more and more frequent after this, but less happy. She'd get combative with the window and scream at whoever she believed to be there. Then it just stopped one day. One of the last conversations I had with Marie before she passed, she told me not to let them take me into those woods. And I hope they didn't. When I was seven years old, my father took my older brother and I to a cabin in the middle of literally nowhere for a week as a vacation. We also took our cat with us. Everybody had their own room and I had the room furthest from the other two positioned right where the woods started. There was a window right next to my bed, and on the right side, there was a tree right next to it. 
but I remember getting to climb the previous day without success. The bedrooms were on the second floor, by the way, and the window didn't have any curtains or blinds to cover it. One night, I remember feeling really homesick and unable to sleep. The cat was lying on the bed with me. I was reading a comic book with a flashlight. When around 2 a.m., I began hearing a tapping on my window. At first, I just assumed it was a tree branch tapping on the window because it was a windy night after all. And that was until I began to hear whispers. I just remember freezing in fear, feeling like a bunch of ice water had just been poured on top of me. I could hear whoever it was tapping and then saying things like, Open up, son. It's daddy. Let me and Luke, it's cold out here. And the worst one I heard was, Come on, it's daddy. I just want to cuddle was paralyzed by fear. I just lay on my side, facing away from the window, terrified, close to tears. I knew it wasn't my father, and in my imagination, I thought it was the boogeyman or some kind of other creature. It would kill me. All the while, my cat was hissing and clawing at this guy. I just remember holding him, burying my face into his fur because he felt like a safety net. I won defense against this guy as I couldn't work up the nerve to call for my father. Then I remember hearing this horrible screeching noise. I looked around to see what it was. And I could see this guy with the most maniacal grin that I've ever seen, like something out of a horror movie, dragging a pocket knife against the glass, making that horrendous noise. I found my voice and screamed bloody murder. The grin disappeared. He looked like a combination of horrified and absolute full of rage. But then my father came barreling into the room with his hunting rifle. And as you can imagine, seeing that made this guy panic and sort of drop backwards. My father looked at me and made sure I was okay. My brother ran in the room and then my father went off to go catch this guy, hopefully before he got away. But unfortunately, it wasn't a long drop and the man probably only got a few bruises from it. He was definitely gone by the time my father got out there. We waited the night. Nobody slept. Before we packed up and went home the following day. I have no clue if they ever caught that guy. Though I remember my father following a police report and having me talk to the police to give them a description. I'm still grateful for my cat. He turns 14 this week and is still as feisty as ever. For providing me comfort during that awful, terrifying night. I was only 10 the last time that my family had gone to our cabin for a vacation. We used to go every year, but after that time, we stopped, which I was glad about because something really strange happened the last time I was there. It was me, my older sister, my mother, and my father. They had all gone to sleep and I was restless. I mean, it was early and I was 10 so I didn't know what to do with myself. I end up making the foolish decision to sneak out and stare at the stars. We didn't get those kinds of sights in the city, so I snuck out of the cabin as quietly as I could and made my way to the fire pit. The fire had long been put out, but it was a good place to sit and overlook the field near the cabin and see the stars. As I sat there, I looked out into the field and at first, I couldn't tell what I was seeing. It looked like something was moving in the tree line just beyond the field. It wasn't until it stepped out into the light that I realized it was a man, and he appeared to be heading towards the woods on the other side of the field. As he made his way through the field, I could see more and more of what he was doing because of the moonlight. I noticed he was dragging something that looked heavy. My heart just about to stop, though when I noticed he stopped moving and turned in my direction, I wasn't sure that he saw me until I noticed he lifted his hand, and I swear he waved. I was so scared, however, to my relief, he just kept on moving. I immediately went inside and didn't say anything about it to my parents. I didn't want to get in trouble for sneaking out. 
It wasn't until five years later, when we were all sitting outside of our home, enjoying some takeout by the pool, that I ended up bringing it up. I didn't think anything of it. We had just been talking about some scary things that happened to us, so I thought it would be a good one to share, but the look on my dad's face told me that I had said something that really freaked him out. That was when he explained to me why we have never gone back to that cabin. Apparently, two weeks after we had left and gone home, my parents were questioned by the police considering a body that they found near our cabin just a few days after we had left. Apparently, upon searching the area, police found nine different bodies buried in the property. I will absolutely never forget what I saw that night or how lucky I am still to be here. I was so excited to be getting back to the cabin with my cousins. It had been a few years since I had been able to join them on their weekend hunting trips. But finally, our schedules lined up and my parents let me go with them. It was just me, my two cousins and their dad, my uncle. We made it to the cabin and began to unpack. The boys and I couldn't wait to get outside and run around the woods for a little while before it got dark. So, that's exactly what we did. We dropped our stuff off and immediately ran outside. We were out there for about two hours before my uncle called us in for dinner. When we got inside, he seemed a bit weird, but I didn't think anything of it. I just sat down and got ready for some dinner. That was when my uncle asked my older cousin if he remembered leaving the door open or anything like that. He seemed to think that a squirrel or some sort of animal had gotten in and had been rummaging through whatever they had left there. My cousin said no, and that was the end of that conversation. We didn't speak another word about it. We just enjoyed our pasta and talked about our plans for the next day. All through the meal though, I couldn't help but shake the feeling like something was looking at us. Again, I just brushed it off like it was nothing and finished eating. After a few hours, it was time for bed. My cousins and I got to stay in the living room of the cabin on the pull-out couch and the reclining chair while my uncle slept in the room that was in the back of the cabin. It took a while because we didn't have a TV, but we eventually fell asleep. However, about an hour after finally passing out, I woke up to my younger cousin shaking me. When I asked him what he needed, he didn't move, but I noticed his eyes were locked onto the window. When I looked, I couldn't help but scream. Ah! On the other side of the window, I could see a full-grown man looking in at us. I yelled so loud that I startled everyone in the cabin awake. My older cousin and my uncle. It was so loud that even the man outside the window seemed shocked. My uncle came running out to ask me what happened. We explained everything and without a second question, my uncle grabbed his cell phone and called the local police. They said they would be at the cabin in about 10 minutes. So until then, we all went into my uncle's room where he had his hunting rifle. And that was where we waited until the police arrived. After about 20 minutes of searching the woods, they found a man who had been hiding out in the bushes about a mile away. When they found him, the police said that he had a knife on him that looked like a kitchen knife. It was one of the ones from the cabin. To this day, the only conclusion that we could come up with is that the man had been staying in the cabin without my uncle knowing, and when we showed up, he had to leave, but he left prepared to come back and take the cabin by force. I'm thankful every day that my little cousin managed to see the man before anything bad could have happened. <laughs> 